SA 10, 4 to 6, PL 1975, C231, S1, amended in 2006. The Asbury Park Board of Education has provided adequate notice of this meeting by sending a notice of the time, date, location, and to the extent known, the agenda of this meeting to the Asbury Park Press and the New Coaster on January 8th of this year via email. Copies of this notice have also been placed at the administrative building, bulletin board, district schools, Asbury Park Municipal Building, the police department, and filed with the city clerk on January uh, 2024. Um, the mission statement for the Asbury Park School District, Asbury Park School District will provide all students with a comprehensive and progressive education where everyone possesses the skills and character to succeed in a diverse and evolving global society. Roll call. Ms. Glassman? Here. Ms. Lazinski? Here. Dr. Maksud? Here. Dr. Penna? Mr. Remy? Here. Ms. Ricks? Mr. Rogers? Here. Vice President Grillo? Here. President Saunders? We have a quorum. Great. Uh, rise for the salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, great. All right, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I would like to say that we are, uh, we should take a vote uh, as per district policy 0155.1, um, board member participation at board meetings using electronic device. Mrs. Ricks is looking to uh, participate in the meeting uh, remotely uh, through the virtual means. So, in accordance with the policy, we need a vote on that. So. So you want somebody to make a motion? Yep. I'll make a motion. I'll second it. Roll call. This is for Ms. Ricks to participate via virtual. Yes. Ms. Lazinski? Dr. Maksud? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Vice President Grillo? Yes. Motion passed. Okay, great. I think we're working on getting her on, on online, right? Okay. All right, if you just let, let us know when she's, when she's online. All right, um, let's do student and teacher recognition for the month. First, I'd like to thank everyone for, everyone for being here tonight. Uh, and, and once a month, we always recognize our students of the month, staff members of the month, and this week, uh, this month, athlete of the month. Right now, I'd like to start with Thurgood Marshall, Dr. Scholes. Thank you, Mr. Provino. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, I have the privilege and honor of introducing a student of the month who is a true leader in and out of the classroom. On behalf of his second grade teacher, Ms. Grapaldi, we would like to describe him as someone who is kind, caring, generous, and very, very, very nurturing and helpful to all of his classmates. He not only excels in academics, but he is very active along with his family in our school community. Joined tonight by his wonderful family, Mr. Miles Parodi, please come get your award. Mom, come on up, please. Take a picture. And in true Thurgood fashion, a backpack of all your favorite things. <laughs> it's heavy, bud. Congratulations. It's very heavy. Careful. <laughs> and here's your reward. Oh, here. Can you see it? 
Yay, Thank Miles. You. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> and now for the Thurgood Marshall Staff of the Month for the month of March. It is again my honor and privilege to introduce a teacher who is the true definition of a team player. I am very grateful to have worked with her for many years. Her co-workers describe her as someone who is compassionate, hardworking, detail-oriented, helpful, always willing to lend a nice helpful hand, and overall very kind and dedicated to her students. Joined tonight by her lovely daughter and beautiful granddaughter, Mrs. Miss Lisa Bruno. Please come get your award. I might need your help with this one. <laughs> yeah, the flowers, yep. Yay, Miss. Thank you. There you go, sir. Now I'd like to call up uh, Ms. Thea Jackson Byers for Bradley Elementary. All right. The Bradley Elementary. <laughs> the Bradley Elementary. Good evening. Um, at this time, it is uh, Delani Delani Vussy has been selected as the Bradley Elementary School's first grade student of the month. Delani demonstrates kindness, respect to everyone she meets. She's always willing to help others. And last but not least, she comes to school eager to learn, always tries her best. Congratulations, Delani. Keep up the good work. This is from your teacher. And as always, it's a family affair. Her mom is a former student. Come on up, mom. Come on up. And you're your sister. Kiara, you are a former student, but now you are a parent, and I just want to say thank you for entrusting your baby the same way we entrusted you and had you. We now have your daughter. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Our, so, the Bradley Elementary School staff member of the month, Nurse Sarah Ott. Nurse Sarah Ott, come on up. <laughs> she just joined us in January, but when I tell you she has patience, no, like literally has patience, like you get it, patience. She has five children at home. Her husband and her sons are here. Come on up, come on up, Dad. Come on up, husband. And she still cares for 363 students. We are so happy to have her. Thank you, Nurse Sarah. Um, Nurse Sarah, the students wanted to do a little something for you, so they made you a giant Band-Aid, and I'm um, saying that we love you. And then, of course, we always want to give you flowers, Nurse Sarah. You want to hold this for Mommy? Hold this for Mommy. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> she just has two of them with us. She has three more. <laughs> Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you, Nurse Sarah. Um, at this time, myself and Dr. Schultz, um, Mr. Medina could not be here tonight for MLK, but we said that we would take the charge. So for the MLK Student of the Month is Diego and Alenco Ramos. Diego is hardworking. He's a hardworking eighth grader who has met every academic expectation thrown his way. He is a fun, wonderful young man who has maintained an A average for the school year. Diego is well on his way to uh, any path he wishes to take. He makes us very proud and we look forward to all his future accomplishments. Congratulations, Diego. Is he here? And Diego, just to let you know, Mr. Medina's not here, but he said he will be giving you your gifts. He's going to share it on Monday. You will get your gifts. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and for the MLK Staff of the Month. It is Angelica Arias, MLK Staff of the Month. Yes, give her a round. She is a remarkable human being, helpful, enthusiastic, willing to go the extra mile. It is MLK's absolute pleasure to announce Miss Angel as Staff of the Month. Miss Angel has done an amazing job helping the main office and school community. She serves on the Climate and Culture Committee and has been the go-to member for the building at large. Congratulations, Miss Angel, so well deserved. Congratulations, you so deserve it. And at this time, yes, I'd like to call up Ms. O'Neill for the high school. Good evening, everyone. We're first going to start by recognizing our Athlete of the Month. Uh, this person is out on the fields, courts, anything. Um, she's an incredible student as well. She is someone that we are very lucky to have in our overall community. Mr. Artizone asked for her to be recognized tonight. It is Lizbeth uh, Villa Hernandez. <laughs> For our students of the month, we are recognizing the 12th grade students at Asbury Park High School who have earned the prestigious seal of biliteracy. These students will graduate um, proving that they are more than proficient not only in English, but also in either Spanish or Haitian Creole. It is an extremely hard accomplishment um, to reach. It is something that is celebrated in high schools across New Jersey, but high schools of thousands of kids tend to have anywhere around 50, 60, and this year we have over nine here tonight. Um, and we also have some 11th graders who reached this accomplishment as well. So we're incredibly proud of them. I'm going to call them up. We're going to take a group picture, and we are celebrating a special lunch with them next week at the high school. So first, if Yandel Garcia Carmona could come up. <laughs> Angel Aprecio Castro. <laughs> Naomi Hernandez. Sandra Hernandez Porras. <laughs> Betsy Lima. I'll do him. Okay. No, I didn't. Eric Lopez Ortiz. Congratulations. Danny Martinez Urbina. Roselli Riano. Denise Rojas Ruiz. Randy Vasquez. And we have one student who earned it this year for Haitian Creole, and that is Brael Paul. Also presenting our Teacher of the Month for the high school. Um, this teacher has been working incredibly hard this year. We have a new course called Modern Global Studies, which is studying things that are currently happening in the world around us, connecting them back to historical events. Uh, he has made his classroom so exciting. There are games incorporated into every lesson. He has, bringing, he has brought in a variety of guest speakers, including veterans for Veterans Day from the Vietnam War, um, the daughter of a Tuskegee uh, Airman, and most recently, Women's uh, League voter representatives to make history really real for our students. Um, it's Mr. Ronco celebrating one of our history teachers.
we'd like to congratulate everybody tonight. Uh, it's a, you did a fantastic job, students as well. Uh, thank you for your all, hard, all your hard work. And, and teachers, thank you for instructing our students. Couldn't do without you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to go into executive session. Um, we need to vote on it. Uh, I know, everyone's like, oh. just hang tight. Um, we're gonna make a vote for it, but just um, asking everyone to, to stick around because it's a very important meeting, especially in terms of the budget. So um, please hang, okay? Um, make a motion to go into executive session. I'll move it. Second. Second. Roll call. Ms. Glassman? Yes. Ms. Lisinski? Yes. Dr. Maksud? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Vice President Grillo? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, the board's going to go into closed executive session for approximately 30 minutes to discuss matters related to personnel, litigation, contracts, and other related matters. We will be returning to this room in approximately 30 minutes. The board will not be taking any formal action in an executive session. To the extent that the board is going to take any formal action, it will be done here in this room in front of the public. Thank you. Mr. Zinski? Here. Dr. Maksu? Here. Mr. Remy? Present. I believe Ms. Ricks is um, on virtual. Okay. If she could just raise her hand online. She did. Thank you. Mr. Rogers? Vice President Grillo? Here. President Saunders? Yes. We have a quorum. I first would like to ask the board if we can do the public participation portion of the meeting first. We're going to do one of the student presentations first. No, no. We're going to do student presentation first and then we'll do public participation. I'm sorry. A second. Ms. Wendy, it seems like you have some questions, but the thing that I, w I wanted to do is do the um, student presentation first so we can see exactly what our students are doing and then do the public participation. So I know we have some high school students that want to come, on, come and give a presentation. respectfully ask you to tell us your name and what grade you are in and what school you go to. Uh, I, I, mean, I know you go to high school, but you know. 
Um, my name is Sandra Hernandez. I am in 12th grade at the I go to Asbury Park High School. I'm part of the class of 2024. Um, I'm here to advocate for the change of the graduation date. Um, Asbury Park High School's class 2024 is, is requesting to change our graduation date from June 20th, 2024 to June 18th, 2024. The current graduation date of June 20th is the same graduation date as for many other districts such as Neptune High School, Monmouth Regional, Freehold High School, and among others. Many of our teachers and family members will not be able to attend the Asbury Park High School's graduation ceremony due to these clear conflicts. In the past, Asbury Park has always made sure its graduation date didn't conflict with other local schools. We hope the same can happen for the class of 2024. Please remember that the class of 2024 is the most impacted by the global pandemic COVID and never got to enjoy many of our normal celebrations leading up to graduation. Due to the conflict in other graduation ceremonies and COVID's impact on us, the class of 2024 should be able to probably commemorate this exciting moment with all of our teachers and families. And I have a petition here signed by many of the students of Asbury Park High School's class of 2024 to reconsider the selected date of graduation. Um, good evening, my name is Angel Aparicio. I'm a senior at Asbury Park High School representing the class of 2024. I am here, to, I am here today to advocate with my fellow classmates for the change in our graduation date. To me, graduation is something I want to spend with family and teachers who have pushed me to become the person I am today. But with our current graduation date, that won't be possible, and I'm hoping you consider making this change on behalf of the class of 2024. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Roselli Riano, and I am a senior at Asbury Park High School, representing the class of 2024. I came here tonight to support the decision taken by my fellow classmates to change graduation date. Like my classmates mentioned, many teachers aren't able to make it to our graduation due to the fact that it's also other schools' graduation day. I would like graduation to be memorable and have all teachers and family members that pushed us to succeed to be there. Graduation day should be a day to celebrate and be excited about it, not a day to worry who is not gonna be there. For this reason, we ask to change graduation day. Thank you. We wanna say thank you to Mr. Gervino for um, allowing us to speak tonight. And thank you, have a good night. Don't go anywhere, stay right there. First of all, I would like everybody to stand up and give them a standing ovation. So many of you know me from back in the day, right? I've had you as elementary or middle school, right? 2001 I've been here. Um, and you, you approached me at the high school the other day when I was doing my walkthroughs. And I said, absolutely, you should. You should get up in front of us and tell us how you feel and what you're going through. And we heard you. We have changed your graduation date to the 18th. Thank you very much. The one thing I want to say is I can appreciate you guys' courage and ability to come up here and speak. I'm not the greatest orator at my age, but I just want to say you guys did a wonderful job, and we appreciate you. Don't forget this night. We need to hear your voices, so please come up here and email us, talk to us. We need your voices, so congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. Was that June 18th? Was it June 18th you asked for? Okay, I just wanted to check my calendar. I don't know. 
Thank you guys. Have a great night. Thank you very much. Hey, board member Lou Dorothy, you gotta come. You gotta come. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. President, one, one quick thing if I can uh, mention to Mr. Gerbino. In the past, um, we've gotten requests many times from the mayor and council to be in, to, to have, uh, to get invited to the, the graduation ceremony and everything. If we could do that with a little bit of advanced time, if it conflicts with any city thing, they'll, they'll have enough time to switch it around and, and uh, they can participate in the graduation. So, just wanted to put that out there. I'll absolutely make that happen. It will happen. Thank you. We're going to move to the um, public participation portion of this meeting. In accordance with the board policy 0167, the Asbury Park Board of Ed Education recognizes the value of the public commitment on educational issues and other matters of importance and provide members of the public to speak with the opportunity to express themselves on school matters of the community interest. The public comments portion of the meeting is not a question and answer session, and all public comments shall be directed to the board president or presiding officers of the meeting. Members of the public uh, who wish to make public comments must be recognized by presiding officers and provide his, in, his or her name, municipality of residence, and group affiliation if applicable. All public comments shall be directed to the presiding officer and are limited to three minutes in duration. Members of the public who do not follow the foregoing rules and interfere with the orderly operation of the board meeting may be removed from the meeting. Public participation. Good evening. My name is Arva Council. My address is 302 3rd Avenue, Asbury Park, New Jersey. And I'm standing here because I want to thank Mr. Gervino for Monday. Um, I had a meeting at the school and it was at 12 o'clock and he was a little bit late and he came and he talked with me for 15 minutes and make sure that everything is going to be okay in this district. And I just want the board to know that before I make any decisions, please think with your head, not with your emotions. And what I mean by that, the last board meeting, three members walked out. And when you run and you sit on the platform, it's always about the kids, because I ran. And on the signs it says kids first. And I felt that that night, you didn't put the kids first. And I'm not here to bash you. I'm not here to put you down. But I appreciate you coming back and thinking about the kids. And another thing, on the agenda I see about summer school is Monday through Thursday. Please don't vote on this because it's usually Monday through Friday. And it's a week after the kids get out and they um, get out of summer school a week before they come back. So it's on the agenda. And it's usually Monday through Friday, not Monday through Thursday. Thank you. I hold it. No, band into it. Band into it. Okay, sorry. Hello, Mr. President, board members. I'm Liz Homer. I'm a special ed paraprofessional at Thurgood Marshall Elementary School, and I live in West Long Branch. I had to come here and tell everybody how great we've all been feeling. Um, for the first time in a long time, I really feel seen and valued. When paras recently got directive that we no longer had breaks and our lunch was cut to 25 minutes, it really made myself and others feel kind of worthless. Did we not work hard enough to earn these breaks? Did we not deserve them? Are we looked upon as that invaluable that we weren't allowed to have 15 minutes to collect ourselves? We work hard. We are with our students the entire day, including specials, lunch, and recess. Yet apparently we were not deserving of a few moments just to sit quietly. 
And then Mr. Gerbino graciously went back to past practice. We now get to have breaks and a 30 minute lunch and for that I am so grateful. And thank you Mr. Gerbino for visiting our classrooms by yourself without any intention of intimidation. Members of the board, thank you for hearing our concerns. It means more than you know. You all see us. We appreciate you and you appreciate us. Thank you for knowing that paraprofessionals are an extremely valuable part of this district. I'm looking forward to a new day here in Asbury Park, a place where educators can feel safe again, where students will see the joy on our faces, where the stress of the unknown will be replaced by open and honest conversations, a district that works together to do what's right for the beautiful students of Asbury Park. I have restored hope and can't wait to see what wonderful things will happen. Thank all of you so, so much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Good evening, and Mr. President, uh, Mr. Chapino, um, board, I thank you for an opportunity. Everybody that I know that works for the district feels happier. So I just want to say that. Um, again, Pamela Major, I'm at 1201 Springwood Avenue, Asbury Park. And I come here tonight on behalf of Brookdale Community College. I've called a few times and I did get a response from a staff member to let you know about the Community College Opportunities Grant. This grant allows people who earn under $100,000 or their household have a total income of less than $100,000 to go to Brookdale tuition free. That goes for any staff members who don't have degrees already. That may influence some of your maintenance staff, some of your security staff. They also can be a part of this. But there are many students, uh, many of whom were just speaking now, they can come to Brookdale tuition free. I keep saying tuition free. Um, tuition free because I know many people and many of you may remember what it's like to pay a student loan. <laughs> to, to give these students the opportunity to not have to do that and saving them, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars is something that I think you can all get behind and invest in. And so I'm more than happy to speak later about this, but I wanted to come publicly say thank you that someone actually did call me back. I've had many times when that has not happened, but this time it did happen. But we want to make sure that these students can go to Brookdale, their community college, tuition free. Thank you. I'm going to direct you to uh, Mr. Gerbino so that you can have some dialogue in which for the, um, the grants and stuff like that so that this can happen. Um, because as a graduate of Brookdale, I understand the, and back then it was only $66 a credit, but I'm pretty sure it's a lot more expensive than and now. Yeah, uh, well, I'll just say this very quickly. Um, students can go to the Neptune site on Monday. We're starting um, you know, admissions, the admissions process there. There's a FAFSA coach that's there as well. So we'll make it as simple as possible. And the mentors are there to hold hands and make sure that students are also um, emotionally have someone to talk to when things get challenging because college is sometimes not fun. So thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Lynn Johnson. I live in Oakhurst, 33 Peachtree Road. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the board for your decision last week. We walked into school on Friday and it was like a cloud was lifted. Most of the staff was all smiles and something we haven't seen or felt in a while. Mr. Gerbino has been in our class at least once a week smiling, saying hi to the students, and this is something that we are not used to. It is so nice to see him and not be bombarded with nine other administrators interrupting lessons. Our Asbury family feel has been restored. We can't wait to see what the future holds. I just want to thank everybody so much. Thank you for your comments. Good evening. 
My name is Shannon Young. I am the preschool instructional coach district wide, and I have been in the Asbury Park School District for 19 years. I live, on, I live in Matawan, New Jersey. I want to thank you all. I wanted to thank all of you on the Board of Education for considering our concerns and pleas for help. The stress and hostility within the district for the past two and a half years has been traumatic for all. I want to thank the acting superintendent, Mr. Jabino, for reconsidering and addressing some of our concerns and the damage that has been done to the students and the teachers. One change in particular that I would like to discuss that has been changed since he took took his role as acting superintendent on February 22nd is the reinstatement of paraprofessional breaks. As per, as per directive made by central office prior to his, prior to him taking office as acting superintendent, paraprofessionals lost their two breaks. This change did not save the district any money, nor did it, nor did it have any impact on the district except for hurting the staff and the students. This was a cruel change to the working load and working conditions for our hard work staff and the backbone of our school district. Power professionals keep our most, most disabled students safe. Some of their duties include toileting, medical timing, following behavior modification plans and IEP updates. They also assist students with instruction. So I thank you, Mr. Jabino, for reinstating the breaks for paraprofessionals, honoring the APEA collective bargaining agreement, and allowing teachers and paraprofessionals to schedule their breaks around the instruction needs of the students. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sean Hamilton. I'm uh, living large at 84 Creek Road, Keensburg, New Jersey. Still a place to buy if you're looking. Uh, I've been here 25 years, and currently I'm a grade five math teacher. Um, for the first time in a long time, I get to stand up here and not bring up negative things about our district, and it makes me happy. I know there's a lot of tumultuous emotion last meeting, and I'm glad we're all past that. We're all as emotional as you guys are because we all care about our kids. I want to thank Mr. Jabino, one, for showing up at the uh, St. Patrick's Day Parade, along with Dr. Matsu, Mr. Rogers was there, Mr. Grillo, Ms. Glassman. I want to thank you for coming out. Senator Gopal was there. Assemblywoman uh, Peter Paul was there. It was a nice showing, and for the first time in nearly 25 years, I've never seen a more solid, group of people, teachers, administrators, walking together in solidarity. And trust me, kids noticed it, parents noticed it. There's been a whole different vibe in our school at Thurgood Marshall. The kids, when they came in and saw Mr. Gerbino walk in, no one looked at him as, as, who is this stranger coming to our room with a clipboard disrupting our instruction? They all said, hey, Mr. G, hi, Mr. Gerbino, and I want to thank you again. Thank you for remembering Pi Day for the math people. We had a big day today with our fifth graders. It was a wonderful day, uh, but I want to thank you for reminding us that, you know, why we're really here. Hopefully the politics, the nepotism, the favoritism, all that has ended. I see, I, I, someone said, uh, you know, there are brighter days ahead. The bright days started Thursday night. And I can't, again, like others reiterated, I can't wait to see what we can do and what you can do for our kids. Once again, thank you all very, very much. My name is Nancy Sabino. I live at uh, 1000 4th Avenue. I've been a resident here in Asbury Park since 2009. Uh, former business owner, now retired, and uh, a volunteer here at the Bradley School for the last 10 years with the Reading Buddies program. I know how good the kids are here. I know how much they really want to excel and how great the teachers are keeping them motivated, challenged, and in line when we come to read. We were told last night at the council meeting that because of the school budget, our taxes are going to go up next year 25 percent. That's crushing to anybody who's lived here and has paid taxes for this amount of time. I know you all feel the same way if you own homes in Asbury Park. 
I really want to urge you to work together with the council to come up with creative ways to get the budget fulfilled. Maybe look at some of those schools and offices and buildings that no longer are really necessary in their current state and do something because more and more people are going to be coming here the way they come to the council meetings to say, you got to do something. Otherwise, people are just going to start leaving. And we don't want that to happen. I know you don't want that to happen. The less students, the less budget. So think about it. And I'm only one person, but I know a lot of other residents. And anybody that hears that 25% increase does an immediate intake of breath, because that's far more than we can do, especially on fixed income. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Good evening, board. My name is Nina Sumlin. I'm a resident of Asbury Park. Um, and I'd just like to say, from here on out, my hands go out to all our teachers to say I'm glad they all feel more comfortable in being able to come to the school district and do their jobs. What I'm putting on the table tonight is now that we've taken care of our staff, now I need you guys to really take our children more seriously. Because at the end of the day, if it wasn't for our children, none of these people, let alone you, would be here. So from today forward, I'm asking, at the end of the day, let's start focusing on our children and stop focusing on politics or personal issues, personal gains or whatever, because when it's all said and done, without our babies, none of you guys would be in this building tonight. And I'm going to, Jabina, you know I love you to death, but I'm going to tell you the same thing I've told everybody sitting in your seat. Me and my oxygen machine don't have a problem coming to a board meeting or to your office and calling anybody out on whatever they're not doing. And that also goes for my board president. I'm telling you, from here on out, my whole focus in this district and in this community is all about accountability when it comes to our families and our children. So I will personally be holding every last one of you guys accountable. Thank you. Ms. Summerlin. Ms. Summer, wait, wait, wait. Come back to the microphone for a second. You forgot something really important. When is your next PTO meeting at the middle school? Oh, yes. Actually, it's next Thursday, March 21st at 4 p.m. Okay, Please thank you. Please send out an email. Please send us an email. Dave Ronco, Asbury Park High School. I've been here for 20 years. I live in Lakewood. I just want to make this short and quick. I'm proud to say we finally have a captain that's going to steer us in the right direction. And uh, Mr. Jabino, it's great to work with you again. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jessica Daniels. I live at 414 Ridge Avenue, and I'm a high school teacher. Um, and at the high school. Sorry, I'm nervous. I'm here tonight to thank this Board of Education from the very bottom of my heart. It has been a long, arduous last few years, one where teachers' voices have been not only stifled, but blatantly ignored at all levels here in Asbury Park. I'm beyond elated for a man for a future where the staff who has given their entire adult lives to the kids of Asbury Park can now be a part of improving this district one voice at a time. I realize that there are teachers in Asbury Park who need to show improvement. This fact likely makes me just as angry as it makes you, and I wouldn't be myself if I didn't point that out here tonight. But what I can also say is that this teacher and many others like her work with every ounce of their beings to teach, love, and support the students of Asbury Park day in and day out. Last year, every single one of my juniors passed the NJGPA except one, representing the highest APHS scores in years. Also, I have had perfect attendance for so long it's become a running joke amongst my colleagues. Further, I haven't written a student up in years and rarely if ever have discipline issues. And finally, I haven't missed a single Asbury Park sporting event in as long as I can remember. I don't say this to brag, I say this to express that I represent a plethora of the staff here in the Asbury Park School District. And yet, in recent years, I have never once been brought to the table for any decisions pertaining to the children. I have rarely, if ever, been asked my opinion on critical educational decisions. I have not been included in conversations that will impact the teaching and learning of the very kids that I have loved and taught for almost 20 years. 
Instead, I, along with the collective unit of the hardworking teachers here, have been vilified, blamed, clumped together, and scapegoated. This is not only unfair, but it is counterproductive to creating a school district focused on children, learning, and improvement, when those in the trenches have no voice, especially those in the trenches who are actually succeeding. I also wouldn't be me if I didn't point out that these are my words, and the words of no one else. I am not here to represent the union, or any political party party or any other entity that's been brought up as of late. I am here to voice the overarching opinion of the strong, devoted teachers in this district. We are so extraordinarily happy to finally feel like we are moving in a direction of growth, collaboration, and genuine progress. I want to close with this. Let me just take a breath. Two weeks ago, when Asbury Park High School senior Iquan Crawford won his monumental regional wrestling matches. At Jackson Liberty High School, on a rainy, cold Saturday afternoon, he had two fans in the stands, both unpaid and there voluntarily, me and Mr. Gerbino. You may agree or disagree with Mr. Gerbino as the acting superintendent, and that's okay. But what I will say is that he knows who has given their hearts, their souls, and sometimes even their sanity to the children here in Asbury Park. And he knows it's time for these very people to have a chance to speak, to lead, to flourish, and make this district stronger than it has ever been. That's it. Thank you for your comment. Hello, Edley Victorin, Union County, speech language pathologist in the district. Okay, I'm just gonna take it off, sorry. All right, um, I like to make the board administration and staff aware, if you're not already aware, that Haiti is currently experiencing civil political unrest where members of the opposition have taken control of the prisons, airports, and most essential places. We have Haitian students at all levels, elementary, middle, and high school, um, who have families in Haiti. Some are experiencing stress and anxiety, and also staff, I'd like to say, I'm one of them, um, related to what's happening and the effects on their families living in Haiti. Um, some of these students may not express their concerns, that's also a cultural thing for, uh, for most, um, or may not seek help. But I am hoping that we may have some resources, counseling, available for our students. Um, I don't know what that looks like, but I'd just like to bring that uh, to the front. Um, I'd also sidebar, um, I'd like to thank the board, again, I'm just going to echo what's been said already, for listening. Um, some of us are still experiencing things, but I'll speak for myself. I am here because I am dedicated to my students. I am here because I care. And I am ready and willing to move forward and to do what we need to do in order to move our stu students forward and to move our district forward. We don't want to be ranked 400 or whatever it is. It's time for us to move forward. Asbury Park is known for its arts. We have so many kids who are artistic. We have so many kids who are talented. We need to start investing the time and the money in our kids. No more raises, no more, you know, backhand deal, no. Let's start investing that time and that money in our students. Because I don't want to hear when I need a test or something that we don't have the budget. It's not good enough. So I'm happy, I'm, I'm thankful for all of you, and I look forward to the future. Thank you. Mr. Doran, Mr. Yes. Doran, Thank you. contact my office tomorrow. Absolutely. And Mr. Ruiz will work with you, try to set something up for the students. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, my name is Mary Spinarkle. I'm a resident of Neptune, New Jersey, um, and I am a third year teacher at Asbury Park High School. Um, I teach ESL, English as a Second Language, I teach World History, I teach US One, and I teach Career Explorations. 
Um, last year, I was the assistant coach for the girls' varsity soccer team, and I hope to start a varsity girls lacrosse program at the high school in the coming years. Um, I also tu tutor several students after school, and I'm a strong and also very loud supporter of students at various athletic events. Um, I say all this as a way to show you that despite my short time in the district, I am invested in its children, in the district's success, and in the future under our new leadership. I am so, I'm so proud to be an Asbury Park teacher. Um, I'm so proud to see my students grow and improve and believe in themselves every day. I am honored to stand witness to those victories, um, all of which are so big and meaningful and important. Um, I recently took my career explorations class on a field trip to fulfill NJ um, so we could gain some volunteer experience to put on our resumes we were making in class. Um, while there, another volunteer asked me about my students. I told her about the class, gave her a little background on the students. And when she remarked at how hardworking and how sincere they were in their efforts and desire to help, I just told her, these, these are the best people I know. Uh, my love for my students brings me here tonight to tell you that I'm very hopeful for the future and direction of this district. Um, I am hopeful that the board and our central administration are ready to listen to its teachers um, on how we can better serve those absolute best people I know and give them only our best as adults who they are meant to trust. Uh, these students are so good and so intelligent and so eager to learn and succeed. Um, and I'm excited to work together to figure out how we can improve how we serve them. Um, particularly as an ESL teacher, um, I am e even more excited to figure out how we can better serve our students with stronger programming and activities that cultivate a welcoming environment for um, our immigrant students and their families. Uh, I'm hopeful that you, the board, central admin, want to hear from your local stakeholders, teachers, parents, students. Um, hear us as teachers and paraprofessionals when we say that we want to do the jobs to the best of our ability. Um, hear us when we say we want to work together. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs> Good evening, Sheila Brazil, board president, Mrs. Rubino, administrators, staff. Um, I'm so glad that everybody is in a better place, a better space, Mrs. Rubino. It goes, I guess a shout out goes out to you, huh? But um, seriously, now that everybody is you know, want to be on one accord. Everybody have their breaks back, have their time back, can rest. So the next test we have for the students, I expect the grades to go up. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, have a good night. Good evening, my name is Shelly Sanders. I am a teacher at um, Dr. Martin Luther King Middle School. Mm -hmm. I've been in the district since 1979. I know I look young, but I started started Bangs Avenue in 1979. I've been here ever since. Never left. So I am uh, I bleed blue. I just wanted to talk about some of the things that's going on at the middle school. And uh, I know some of you had a chance to come visit when we did Teach Rock with um, Stephen Van Zant. We did Read Across America. We had a published author come in and read to our kids. I'm employing you to come out to this middle school more to see the wonderful things that we're doing. I know you hear a lot of negative things, but I want you to see we're doing a lot of positive things. And I hope that the change that we have that teachers are still held accountable. I don't want it to be a change where teachers think like, okay, now I can relax. No, this is where the fight starts. Because I think we're all here for the same reason and that's for the students of Asbury Park. So I want us to stand together and no matter who sits in that seat, I want us to all work together for the students of Asbury Park. I am a proud grandmother of a first, first grader at the great Bradley Elementary. And I'm, on behalf of my grandson, I expect everybody, including myself, to do our job to make sure that these children are learning. Thank you. I appreciate 
I appreciate all you com all, all the comments that were made. Um, the one thing that I do want to say is I don't believe in perfection, um, and the board looked at a three-tier approach to their decision. It was the administration, the teachers, and the community. We still have a lot of hard work to do. And it's not going to be easy. Mm. To be quite frank with you, I wouldn't want to be, I've been in leadership over 20 years, and I wouldn't want to be in Mr. Dubrino's seat right now. We hear you as a community. And I just want to thank Mr. Dubrino for stepping up and doing his job. This was one of the most positive meetings that I've ever been in. And I've been on the board for 10 years, and I've, it's just been like a revolving door, so to speak. Thank you, Mr. Dubrino. I can see that the morale has gone up tremendously, and I appreciate you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. President, can I just make uh, just a point of privilege to say something? Um, I wanted to see if uh, speaking to um, the mental health issue that someone brought up regarding our specifically our Haitian students and staff, is there any way that we can redirect or bring in services to kind of help with this ongoing crisis? Um, you know. Mental health counselors come in whenever there's other crises that happen. I think this deserves or merits um, a little bit of an extra redirection. What do you think? Um, I'm going to be speaking to Mr. Ruiz tomorrow um, regarding that exact request. Okay. So we will have something planned this week. We'll work with Ms. Victorian as well. Um, and we will provide for our students. That's a guarantee. Okay. Thank you. like to close public participation part of the meeting and we do have a presentation, presentation from school board. Presentation from school boards. Hold on, I got something to say real quick. I just want to apologize for my emotions, my words, my actions, disappointment that I may have done last meeting. I just want us to move forward and do what's right, do what we all came here to do, and that's provide opportunities for the children in this district. Now we'll do the presentation for, from the school boards.
made a mistake when I said that. Uh, and I know you're live streaming, so I guess I need to use it. I also know that there are a couple of new board members here, but I know that a number of you are experienced, so you've gone through the ethics presentation before. Uh, and for the newer board members, you probably already have completed your new board member orientation and you heard about ethics. So while I'm not saying I'm going to run through this, I'm, I'm not going to hit every detail to the fine point. If there's something that comes up, you'll stop me. I'm going to do the presentation. What I will do is the PowerPoint, I will email it to your BA tomorrow so that she can share it with the board. But typically, I prefer not to give it out ahead of time. You did each get a package that it's very slim. And what it has in it is the sheet that everybody needs to sign that they completed the ethics training. It also has in there the 10 pieces of the ethics uh, code. And there's also a sheet in there that's new this year. Uh, uh, and all the board members received it, uh, superintendent received it. Um, it has in there a, one of the slides that we'll get to that talks about things like nepotism and who can, who can vote on certain things. Uh, I'm also going to talk about the disclaimer for a quick second. I'm not an attorney. I don't play one on TV either. All right, so, but what I am telling you is I'm here to do a presentation and any questions that really come up and anything that you have a sincere question about in terms of that doesn't make sense, what you should always do is you should refer back to your board attorney. That's what you're paying him for. He's the one who has, who has the knowledge on it. I'm doing the presentation in terms of what I need to cover. Ethics and accountability. Public service is a core value that can improve the lives in the world around you. As a school official, you have the honor of serving the public. So much of what we're going to talk about this evening with this presentation is the perception. Clearly, from what I heard a few minutes ago, the perception of this board is that you're on the right track. And you need to always have that in mind. The perception is, is the, the Ethics Act is a set of minimum ethical standards. Part of this is also to remember that you serve now all of your community. So it's not just the students, but it is all the community. It's those people who live in the town who have nothing to do with your schools. You know, senior citizens who, who maybe have grandchildren or, or children who are still in the district. Uh, there, are, there are certainly citizens in your town who have never had any involvement with the school, but they're certainly paying taxes. So they have, they have a right to be represented. So it's essential that the conduct uh, of the local board holds the respect and confidence of the people. These board members and administrators must avoid conduct which is in violation of the public trust. The way I like to think of it is, you know, for those of you who have been in the business world, you're the board of directors. They're, they're your stockholders. You know, they elected you to sit in those seats and they have a right to, to have confidence in you to see how you do your business and to, uh, to be very confident that you're looking out for everybody's interest. School Ethics Act was established. Uh, it created the commission. It created prohibited acts. The code of ethics, which you have in that folder. Mandatory training requirements and a disclosure statement. We'll hit each one of those briefly. Conflict of interest and disclosure statements. You all had to sign a disclosure statement which says uh, what, what family members or yourself, what family members might have an interest in any type of business that's doing business with the district. They never ask how much you make, but they do ask, the state does require that they know if you have a, a brother-in-law, a cousin, a son, or something like that, who's involved with a business that the district is paying in some respect. That sheet, just in case you're not aware of it, becomes public knowledge. And if somebody does an internet search on your name, that sheet's up there. So again, they don't ask how much they make, but they want to know about all professional staff members, uh, board members, charter school trustees, administrators, everybody has to fill that out. The Code of Ethics and Mandatory Training. Uh, New Jersey School Boards is not a state organization. It's an association made up of the 560 some districts in the state, but we are the ones who are commissioned to make sure that we do the training. Uh, for folks who don't know it in the audience, what happens with board members is when they come on, they're required to go to training the first year, second year, and third year of their first term, and again, 
the first year of every subsequent term, and that's really just legal updates. But the mandatory training has to be done. If somebody doesn't fulfill the mandatory training, they can be taken off their board. Uh, they can be removed. Um, and that has happened. Uh, the big change this year was they changed it now that the uh, board members have to go to training within the first 90 days of their board, their board service. In the past, you'd have people that were holding off and not going for training until November. They had already been on the board for a year. The School Ethics Commission serves at the uh, pleasure of the governor. He appoints, he or she, appoints the, uh, the uh, people to the Ethics Commission. It's nine members, five are non-school officials, two are school board members, and two school administrators. And uh, I heard somebody mention the term uh, you know, parties before, and, and no political party can kidnap this. It's a maximum of five members from any one party who can be part of that commission. Advisory opinions and ethics complaints. I'll try to do this one quickly. Here's the difference. Advisory opinions are for something that's going to happen in the future. I'll use myself as the example here. My full-time job is I'm a real estate agent. A number of years ago when I was still on the board, I asked the commission for an advisory opinion in terms of what I could do in the school program for the play. You know, and as long as I just said that I was a real estate person, that was fine. I couldn't say I'm a real estate person and also the board of education president. So you have to, you can ask an advisory opinion for, to make sure you stay out of trouble. It's really you do it yourself. Nobody else does it. If you have a question about something, you want to make sure you're in the right and that you're not going to get in trouble, you can ask for an advisory uh, opinion. Uh, ethics complaints are something completely different. An ethics complaint can be filed by anybody. It can be filed by fellow board members, by administrators, by members of the public, by students. An ethics complaint can be filed by anybody. and it's for somebody who is alleging that there's been a violation of the School Ethics Act or Code of Ethics. Uh, the SEC hears about 85 complaints a year and about another 35 advisory opinions. Those opinions and, and the complaints are also made public and are, are available on the internet. And the reason for that, especially with the advisory uh, opinions, is they do that to if somebody else is going to have the same question down the road. Am I, am I right? I'll get off of it. Uh, so if you have a question, it's a good chance that somewhere along the line somebody else is going to have a similar question. So you can look up and to see what the advisory opinions that have been filed are. I talked about the training. The first 90 days, governance one, governance two, three, and then the governance four, the legal updates, the first, the first year of every subsequent term. Uh, those trainings are done in person live, virtual, self-paced online. Uh, they try to make it as much, as available as possible to make sure that everybody gets the training in. Talked about the disclosure statements. New school officials must file disclosure statements within the 30 days of the start of employment. Returning school officials, April 30th deadline to file the disclosure statements. Penalties, there are penalties for somebody who ignores the code of ethics or who violates the code of ethics. There's reprimands, censures, suspensions, or removals. Clearly the removal is the, is the toughest one and it's something you never like to see. But it has happened. An immediate termination where you're taken right off the board. Uh, reprimands, censures, suspensions, again, they are made available to the public. The public has the right to know about those. And I think, personally, I think that's a great thing because we talked about the trust that you want the members of the public to have in the board and how you're doing things. So it's a, it's a good thing that they, if they see that something has come up, that it's available to them. There are 10 pieces to the Code of Ethics. And you're going to get this PowerPoint over the next couple of days. As I said, I'll send it to the Bay or to the superintendent's office tomorrow. But with each one of these, what I'm going to hit is I will hit the 10 uh, pieces. Underneath are the standards. The standards are if somebody were to file a, a, a complaint, an ethics complaint, 
Those are the type of things. So let me do the first one just to give you an example. So the first one, uphold and enforce the laws, rules, and education regulations of the State Board of Ed, court orders pertaining to schools. Desired changes shall be brought only through legal and ethical procedures. I'll give you a good example of where that one played in was a, a number of years ago, number of years ago, I'm to, only talking about three or four years ago, when we had the whole thing going on in the state about the masks. Who was in favor of masks, who wasn't? At that time, it was, it was the law that you had to follow the mask. So it was a court order pertaining to the school. So whether you liked it or not, you had to follow through with that. So at the bottom there, the standard, if somebody were to file a complaint, they have to provide factual evidence to include a copy of the final decision showing that somebody has failed to enforce all the laws, rules, and regulations of the state board. I make decisions in terms of the educational welfare of children. I'll seek to develop and maintain public schools that meet the individual needs of all children. They did the all children in the red. I wish they had really followed through and done the rest here because regardless of ability, race, creed, sex, or social standing. I'm going to talk about ability for just a second. And again, this is a personal thing. I hope you don't mind. A couple of years ago, I was involved with a, a district that was doing their, their strategic plan. They were talking about their mission statement. And somebody wanted the mission statement to say that we're going to, we're going to help each child reach his or her potential. And somebody else made the comment, well, Who's to say what a child's potential is? It's not, our, it's not our place. So what we want to continue to do is maintain schools that individual needs of all children, whether they're the children performing at the lowest level or whether they're your gifted and talented students. Somebody mentioned arts. We always need to make sure we're doing everything we can for all the children. Confine my board actions to policy making, planning, and appraisal. I hope to frame policies and plans only after the board has consulted with those affected to them. You only have one employee. That gentleman sitting right there. He's your only employee. Everybody else who works in the district is the employee of the superintendent. So you have to understand that the only time you have any power is when you're a policy forming committee up here sitting as nine. I'll carry out my responsibility not to administer the schools, but together with my fellow board members to see that they're well run. What does a board member do? They come up with the what. It's up to the superintendent and administration to figure out the how. They have to come up with the action plans in terms of, I, I heard somebody come up and talk about, let's make sure we're doing everything we can for the student in terms of their achievement. It's up to him, him and his administration to figure out how to do that. You're doing the what. Here's what we would like to see happen and that they're well run. Um, I'll leave that for an, another slide. I recognize authority rests with the Board of Education. I'll make no personal promises or any private action that may compromise the board. It's not up to individual members to go out and, and seek somebody. It's not up to you to try to get somebody a job. It's not up to you to do anything other than realize that the authority only comes when you're sitting as a board of nine. You're a board of committees, is that correct? Even the committee, the committee, what does the committee do? The committee makes a recommendation to the full board. So a committee has some authority, some power, but that power is really only to make the recommendation to the board. Uh, that bottom part there, you don't want to do anything to have the potential to compromise the district board of education or the board of trustees. Part of that is to remember also who speaks for the board. You know, usually it's the board president, it's the superintendent, and unless permission is given on a particular topic, when somebody from the press comes to you and wants to ask a question, refer it back to administration. It's not really your place to be, to be saying something that could compromise the district. But at the same time, you refuse to surrender your independent judgment to special interests or partisan political groups for the personal gain of, uh, of friends. Special interests are partisan political groups. I'll touch on that one for a moment. I'll give you a, a real life example. So a, a board member, uh, a, a candidate, somebody who would like to be on the board or even a, a, an existing, a, a person who is an incumbent, election time comes up and the particular union sends out a letter on their own saying, you know, I'd vote for Manny Bowen Jack. That's, that's fine. There's no problem there. 
they're not doing it so that you have a financial gain out of it. But what you have to do at the same time is realize that just because they supported you, you can't now give them any special interest. You can't look at them in terms of, okay, I'm good, you know, they're the ones who supported me, they're the football parents, they're the art parents, they're the band parents. Everybody has to be considered the same. I'll hold confidential all matters pertaining to the schools that if disclosed would needlessly injure individuals of the schools in all matters I'll provide accurate information in concert with my fellow board members interpret to the staff and aspirations of the community for its schools. If there is a complaint that the SEC gets probably more than any other one, there's two of them and this is certainly one of them. Too often people, you know, take something that was in a confidential memo or they, they share something, they, they cut and they paste and all of a sudden it ends up, it ends up in a letter to members of the public or to the press or something. Information that clearly the only way you knew it was because you were a board member. Keep, keep matters confidential that are supposed to end. And the worst thing in the world, get rid of the reply button, reply all button. Reply all is like the worst thing in the world. First off, your attorney will tell you, the last thing you want to do is hit reply all on your phone and the next thing you have is somebody taking your phone to look and see all the different things that, have, that you've done on it. I vote to appoint the best qualified personnel available after consideration of the recommendation of the Chief Administrative Officer. Again, the superintendent is the one who comes to you with the recommendations in terms of here's the staff that I'd like to, I'd like to bring on. It's not up to the board members to pick that staff. It's up to your employee who's the superintendent. I'm going too fast with this or am I all right? Am I going too slow with it? <laughs> I'll support and protect school personnel and proper performance of their duties. Factual evidence of a violation would include evidence that the respondents took deliberate action that resulted in undermining, opposing, or compromising school personnel. I'll refer all complaints to the chief school uh, officer, act on the complaints at public meetings only after failure of an administrative solution. There is a chain of command. That's going to come up again later on in the slides, but understand the chain of command. Always send it back to the lowest level. Somebody has a problem with the teacher, tell them to talk to the teacher. That's not working out, tell them to talk to the principal. That's not working out, but let it go up the chain. But it's not up to you to say it, you know, at the football game, talk to somebody who has a problem with Mrs. Jones, who's the teacher. Well, I understand, I'll take care of that. No, no it's not up to you. Chain of command resolutions, the most expedient manner, uh, the key phrase up there is on that second part, know the chain of command issues uh, that are brought to your attention. Again, what you want is you want situations where if somebody's got a problem, they came to you. It's not for you to search out problems. Again, it's not when you're at the supermarket or the game or somewhere else or a church where you're saying, hey, tell me what's really going on in the school. If they've got a complaint, they're going to let you know. And again, refer to the lowest chain. Board member is advised of any issues, complaint to the uh, district. You don't solicit it. You remember the lowest level. One of the things you want to do though is if you hear something, especially if it's something of concern, let the superintendent know about it. One of the worst things that can happen with boards is surprises. You know, certainly the administration never wants to be surprised with anything. Let them know what you've heard and let them handle it in, in an expedient manner. It's not a matter of you trying to take care of it. When you get this, you're going to see that some of these, uh, some of these cases are, are highlighted in, in blue and have an underline in it. That's a hyperlink. So when you get them, if a particular case up there has a particular interest to you, you can always go back and you can see the actual case that it was from. Um, I'm not going to read each one to you. You don't want me to do that, especially experienced board members. Uh, which one here is interesting? Um, the second one, a meeting uh, with members of the public to discuss a highly divisive board action or to change a holiday name. 
that type of thing. I mean, it's really up to, and that, that brought around a, a reprimand. But it's up to administration to handle it as they need to. You could certainly voice your opinion or you could make a motion that we can we consider this. But again, it's done through the table up here. Uh, the day after the board president lost election, directed the board council to conduct research on another board member who campaigned against him. Not the, not the best way to work together. Not the best way. And that one brought around a censure. Prohibited acts, recuse yourself if there's a benefit to you as school official or your immediate family due to business interests, financial involvement, services, gifts, favors. I'll talk about the term recuse in a few minutes a little bit more, but uh, recusing is when you, you have to, by law, not vote on something. When a conflicted board member votes, there's a distinction between recusal and abstain abstaining. You can abstain from certain things, but there are other things that you have to recuse yourself from. And when you recuse yourself, it should be in that, it should be in that term. I recuse myself from voting on that because my sister-in-law is a nurse in the district or whatever. Um, but let the public know they want to, they're watching your meetings, you're live streaming them, they're sitting here sometimes. They want to have confidence in you. Let them know, I know the ethics, I know the laws, that's why I'm recusing myself. Relationship definitions, I told you the one sheet in your packet that I gave everybody has the latest from the SEC on all the different who puts you in a position where you can vote and who you can't? Your attorney's shaking his head because this is something he did with all time. It was Check actually in. Uh, recently expanded as a result of that A20, I think it's A23, whatever, the brand new advisory opinion that came out with a chart in it, which is a new chart, um, and that's gone beyond what the um, prior advisory opinion uh, A24-17 had in it, if I remember correctly. Uh, look, look in there, and you'll see that that chart. Uh, this on the right-hand side. Is that the one you're talking about? And that chart is in here, but it's also a great chart to keep on your desk to make sure that you keep out of trouble. And again, if there's something you have a question about, that's why you pay an attorney. Although the term "relative" doesn't appear in prohibitive acts or code of ethics, a relative can create a conflict. The tough one here, and again, Counselor, if you want to jump in on this, is anyone not listed be, can be considered an other. That was almost a joke over the last couple of years. And it's like, okay, well, you know, somebody I met once and, and had a cup of coffee with, be smart. You, you know what others are. You know what people can draw you into a problem. That's a chart I was just talking about. Uh, if a relative already works in a district, the, uh, if they're already in the district and you're just coming onto the board, for the new members, if you're just coming onto the board, you have a relative who's already there, that's fine. The problem is that now you're on the board. Once you're on the board, you can't hire anybody and bring anybody onto the district who's, who's a family member. Uh, and the other piece of it is, it also means it also means that if you are recusing yourself because you have a family member involved in the district, you have to also recuse yourself from the evaluation of the superintendent. You can't, be, you can't even be in the room when the conversations are going on. You have an interim superintendent right now. At some point you're going to be talking about what you're going to do with that situation. If you're in a situation where you have to recuse yourself, you can't even be in the room when that conversation is happening. And I'm sure your attorney would keep you on track with that. The best thing to do is if you know already that you have somebody who puts you in that position, let him know. Let him know ahead of time so that he can keep you out of trouble. But you can't be invo involved in the search, selection, or vote to hire a new uh, CSA chief school administrator. Again, it's another, it's another, you know, just follow through on, on when, you can, when you can be involved in collective bargaining. Uh, if somebody works in a district, you're out of it entirely. If you have a self-spouse or dependent child who works out of district, 
you can't participate in the negotiations, but once they've re reached a memorandum of agreement, you can vote the yes or no on that. Other possible conflicts, endorsement of a candidate by a local or statewide union doesn't create a per se future conflict unless your financial contribution is given and is intended to influence. That's kind of the one I said before in terms of the union saying, hey, we're, we're going to endorse you. Well, thank you, but I didn't ask you to do that. Other advisory cases, the writing's too small. I'm not going to go through all of those now. Um, Impact on committee assignments, uh, the board president had a child that, it, it, who was an instructional assistant in the district. He can't, he can't make decisions on what jobs to give him. Board member B's spouse is a 10-month employee in the technology department. You can't be involved in any or no matters, including service on committees that remotely touch upon their, their employment. Uh, that top one is one I already talked about. Uh, a member attended, attended an executive session discussion on candidates to fill a vacant board seat. The husband applied. In both of these, it ended up being a censure. Volunteering in school. Can you still be a class mom as class dad? Yes, you can do that. What you can't do is you can't put yourself in a position where you are deemed or perceived as having any uh, control over a board member. A school play is coming up, and three staff members are involved in building this set. And because you have some expertise in something like that, you want to help too. You can go help, but you can't be the one who's directing them. You can't put yourself in any position at any time where it appears that you are directing staff. Will I be in the building often? There are board members who like to go to visit buildings. Uh, you, can, you can. There's nothing to say you can't go in a building. But anytime you come in a building, that gentleman should know first. You know, hey, I'd like to go visit the, the high school tomorrow. You know, what will, are you just walking the hallways? Again, keep it, keep it light. Don't walk into a room and have a teacher think that you're there checking on him or her. Board members are entrusted to review recommendations from the superintendent, then vote in a way that they feel best serves the needs of the district and its students. An advisory opinion was asked whether a board member can violate the Ethics Act if they vote in the affirmative on a board motion to refuse to implement the New Jersey Student Learning Standards for comprehensive health and physical education. Let's put that in, in language that people will understand. Where that one really pertains is obviously over the last year there have been a lot of situations where in, in certain districts uh, people have come in and they have complained about the health standards, the new health standards, the, the new curriculums that, that pertain to that. If it's something that's approved by the state, you can't say we're not going to do it. You can monitor how you're doing it. You, as board members, you're the ones who approve curriculum. But again, don't do anything contrary to what the State Board of Education says you have to teach. How am I doing on that one? All right. Social media. That, I said there's two things that, that the Ethics Committee gets violations on a lot. One was that sharing confidential. The other one is things that come up on social media. If you're putting something on Facebook, again, that the only way you happen to know it is because you're a board member, you would have had no way to know it otherwise, be careful. Don't, don't do it. If you want to know the truth, the best thing is if you have a Facebook page, get off of it. Don't, I mean, stay off of social media. It can only lead to trouble. One of the things for sure, and especially for the uh, members who, who used social media to help run for their candidacy, if you had set up a Facebook page or social media page as a candidate and you have now been elected, don't continue to use that page 
for commenting on things with the district. Because that was the page that you set up specifically to get on the board, you're on the board now, get off of it. Don't go back to it. Um, you even need to be careful just about impressions. Uh, I'll give one more personal story here. As board president, uh, I happen to be a person who really, really dislikes the term ugly Christmas sweaters. My family wears festive Christmas sweaters. My sister-in-law, my wife, they like them. I had made a comment on Facebook about the fact that I really can't stand the, the topic about ugly, ugly Christmas sweaters. My superintendent, who I get along with very, very well, called me in and said, Mark, do you remember that one of the principals two days ago put up that on Friday is the ugly Christmas sweater competition there in the school? What you did just now is you told that principal, I don't like what you're doing. How is that going to be viewed? He was right. I still don't like them, but I'd have to be careful about how you phrase things. You, again, you don't, you don't want it to be where that principal is now looking at what you did in terms of are you criticizing them. Uh, a board member asked if as a private citizen would it be a violation of the act if they answered operational questions. You can answer operational questions, meaning you know, what, what time, what time is, what day has graduation been moved to? Something like that, public knowledge, you can do that. Don't do something that you only know because you're a board member. Community is aware of your status as a board member. It doesn't matter how many times you put up there, I'm saying this on my own, you're a board member, you're a board member, you're a board member. I don't care where you are, the public knows you are a board member. There is a, a suggested disclaimer, does it get you out of jail free? No. There is a, a disclaimer if you wanted to continue having a public media page, if you wanted to use this, it's a suggestion, it's not the only one you can do, but it's, it's a pretty good one. These statements are not representative of the board. What would cause me to be in violation with the disclaimer based on the content? Again, if the public would perceive that you're speaking in an official capacity or pursuant to official duties, you can get yourself in trouble. General guide, be careful. You know, all of this really boils down to when we're talking about social media, stay off of it. Just, you, you can only get yourself in trouble. Points to consider, school boards recommends boards develop a list of board members and administrators who have a conflict, review it regularly, consult with your board attorney on any ethical issues, identify conflicted members and administrators, let him know ahead of time so he can keep you out of trouble. Continue to check school board notes. School board notes is on New Jersey School Board's website. You can check school board notes and they will publish new advisory opinions, they will, they will publish things. Again, the more you read about things that have happened, the less chance you have of repeating them. In closing, a board member may not deliberately disregard and ignore the ethical standards that are required by law to uphold and enforce. When board members do so, it not only threatens the integrity of the board, it also unnecessarily compromises district personnel subverts the very purpose for which you are elected, namely to serve the needs of the school district and its students. If I was going to add a line there, I would, I would say, remember, it's not just the district and its students, it's your community. As I said, you have members of this community who have nothing to do with you other than that they pay taxes. Keep that community in mind too when, when you make your decisions. There's some resources, you'll get this in the next couple of days. I really thank you for letting me come. If there's any questions that I can handle, fine. More likely any questions are gonna be handled by the attorney. Make sure you sign the sheet saying you went through the training, get it to your BA. Your BA's not here today? Or, oh, I'm sorry. Get it to your BA because they need to be able to report that everybody got it. Thank you. Thanks very much.
Next, we will do the budget presentation by the BA. How do we get these things changed? This shit is ridiculous. Hello. It's late, so I'll try to do, um, won't stand too long before you, but as you know, this is budget season, and I wanted to present to you as a board the preliminary budget. It is due on March the 20th to the county office. Um, because we have the privilege of having a state monitor, Mr. Fisher and I have been having a few conversations already. and. Um, <clears throat> The intent is to um, be able to submit this, but please note that you as a board, your decision really comes on April 28th. Um, so you do have time to discuss, have more meetings, um, anything you feel is necessary for you to come to a comfortable um, place so that you can make um, de a decision on the budget. <clears throat> Okay, so I just want to go through the process. So this process, because of the, some of the unique situations um, that we incurred this year or, uh, or were part of this year, was that we went through the verification of re residency. <clears throat> um, as you know, only Asbury Park um, resident students can attend Asbury Park schools, charter schools, and out-of-district schools for in-district programs and tuition payment to out-of-district um, schools. Um, what a lot of people miss is that part of the budget process is to really, um, as a business administrator, is to really manage the and be part of the October 15th um, student count. Every district is required to count their students um, on October 15th. I want to thank Paul Savoya. He did a phenomenal job this year and in the past years to um, make sure these counts are accurate. So managing that process is important so that the maximum amount of students that are going to your school district is counted. And even the um, different um, components of, of a student, um, if it is their, um, their, their address, it could be um, if they're receiving services from the district, all of that counts. And it's important to get every piece of it um, correct. Again, I want to thank, thank Ms. Lau um, for making sure that we had accurate information for many of our special needs students. <clears throat> We've met um, endlessly, it seems like now, with the directors and principals. We've had meetings. Um, and we started early understanding that we had a major reduction in revenue over the past um, four years, you as a district has received $26 million in regards to ESSA funds. Those ESSA funds are now um, pretty much depleted, and it's important to make sure that what you were using it for, now you have a remedy to either stop the program and, and um, transition that into your current staff, and or how are you going to now 
going to work towards replacing some of those activities or products or even services that came through ESSA funds. So we had many discussions on that. Again, we had individualized meetings talking about re re um, reductions of costs, and we met with the board, the finance committee to discuss costs and various options to reduce costs and begin to generate more income throughout the district. So we've had those discussions also. <clears throat> So the concerns that we are dealing with is the reduction of enrollment. I did an eight-year analysis, and um, one of the things that I want to emphasize is it's so important to really continue to, there's many options parents have, I'll say it like this. So it's important that they understand the options and the benefits to coming to Asbury Park Public Schools. Um, other um, schools are doing a, a, a very an intense job to making sure that people hear their, um, why they come to their schools, but we need to be just as diligent and excited to have the students remain that do come and even um, students that may want to come back because of some, some of the options that may not be in other schools but are here in Asbury Park. The reduction of free and reduced applications for calculation of state aid and federal grants. Um, we'll see the numbers later, but this is a major component when it comes to the calculation of state aid and the calculation of federal funds. Um, your district in past years were, um, was noted to be about 80 to 85 percent of free and reduced. Right now, we are at a 60 percent level, and that was after the activities that we did this fall to um, to um, send applications home to parents and ask them to return those and we got um, we got a number of them back but we still are in need of some more because we do not believe that you are actually a 60% district we still believe that you're close to 85 maybe even 90% so this is real important I'll show you why a little later okay the, um, the um, elimination of the ESSA funds again really understanding what we're going to do going into next year and how we're going to supplement many of the programs that were supported through your ESSA monies the verification of residency for preschool out of district placements and charter. We'll talk about that. And last but certainly not least, the final year of the impact of the S2 bill. So those are all the budget concerns that we went through this um, season. <clears throat> oh, that's off now. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what I did. <laughs> sing and dance right now, but I don't think that would be appropriate. <laughs> huh? The computer crashed. Oh, it was that S2 bill. You got a little nervous. I would get nervous too. <laughs> I tell you. <clears throat> you just want to give us the bottom line? The bottom line? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, I believe all of you as board members do have copies of the presentation, so let's keep on moving and we'll hope to get that going. And I'll do my best for the public to explain to you what that is, and at any time we can give you that information also. So you see in the, in the um, handouts there is an eight-year analysis of the... Um, of the enrollment over the last eight years in Asbury Park. The bottom line in this one, there is a 25% de decrease you've experienced over the last eight years. The numbers, depending on the different areas, are more. Um, on roll students, 26% decrease. Um, special ed cent is a 94% decrease. Special ed private placement, thank you, is 53%, um, and so on. One of the ones I did want to highlight <clears throat> that I talked about earlier, and those are the ones I just went through, the charter schools, there's a uh, as opposed to everything else decreasing in the um, Asbury Park numbers, there's an 89% increase in your charter schools and the amount of students going to charter schools, or at least the ones that they are reporting. Um, your pre-K numbers have also um, decreased over the years, and um, your total enrollment has a decrease of 23%. Free and reduced, I told you I would focus on this. 
And um, free and reduced over the last um, few years has decreased by 45%. But I think the number I wanted to show you was in the, um, third, um, the third column to the end, and then the second column, and then the last column. If you see that decrease, if you look at the numbers, you went from 1,700 to 1,200 applications, or students categorized in free and reduced. That's over 500. That's a decrease of 500 students that were established prior as a free and reduced. That number is significant. You look at that 30%. And then your um, average is going down. You see 70% there is your average right now, but that average is really brought up um, mainly because the charter schools are at 80 to 85% in their free and reduced applications, and we are at 60. So that's why that number is showing 70. Why do I say that? This is the state aid um, report. This is the first page. What I highlighted is this is how your aid is calculated. So what I want to make clear to everyone is even though the S-2 bill has come into play with the reduction of state aid, what's also combating the, the reduction of state aid is the, lim is the re reduction in your free and reduced applications because you have a weighted enrollment. That number is weighted based on the number of students that have free and reduced. So when you say when you see 500, a drop between one year to the next of 500 students being um, being part of the free and reduced calculation, that affects the number that you see there, which is at risk, and then LEP low income. So your numbers for state aid calculation has now lost that impact of the 85 percent you used to have. Again very significant that we that we do as much as we can to get those numbers back to where they belong because your number then for next year should be going up because of the um, the impact of free and reduced applications. The other number that has obviously impacted the amount of state aid you get is the growth calculation rate, which I highlighted and is on the left. As you see, you're at a negative growth um, status with your state aid of negative 2.9690. That means your state aid is going down by that rate. So these, are, these numbers are important so that even though you had um, in 23, 1902, your now weighted enrollment is 18, is 2813. It should be higher if those numbers in your growth rate and also in the free and reduced applications were, um, were higher, you would have a higher weighted enrollment and thus you should, would have had a higher state aid number. Again, these are areas of concern that we need to really work on this coming year. Focus again on charter schools. Um, this is the calculation of the past four, um, four years, five years. They've received 51,043,096 uh, um, in total state aid from you as a district. As we look at the 23 um, state aid, we see their pre enrollment number, which was last October, the numbers that they projected, which is the charter schools, not the district. The charter schools have. have their own ability to project their enrollment is 640 students. So the state aid when we started was 11,782,263. However, they have to do a re-verification in the fall, and that number, as you see, dropped by almost 30 students, and now their state aid is 11,130,444. And that's a decrease of, as you see, 25 students and a decrease in um, state aid that you have to pay out of 651. However, as we have gone through our um, enrollment, um, our residency re-verification, um, we've had um, participation and full participation from Academy Charter, Hope Academy, and Hope Academy Charter. We're still, we have, Regarding College of Chief, we've only had 88 students verify their residency in the district. 
so out of the 284, only 88 of those students' residency has been verified to actually be living in um, Asbury Park. Can you speak on to what we are doing right now as we had um, our meetings and things of that nature as far we as all, like the um, verification process? Absolutely, Mr. Saunders. We are working diligently um, with our attorney to um, really try to remedy this. Because as you see, the numbers matter because the numbers as it's calculated is what you now have to commit to the charter schools. And it's not as if we're trying to um, punish or hurt any child trying to go to any of the schools that we have. However, from wherever the child is coming from, um, based on the law, that district should be paying for those students. So all we're trying to do is to have the monies come from the district that a student would be living in. Right now, the enrollment that we're looking at um, in the state aid is, like I said, from the other sheet is 614, and that's what we're committed to pay. However, um, the estimated enrollment is, again, a number that the charter schools are able to put in. They are estimating an increase in those numbers. The total numbers of students, they're increasing by 127 students. And that increased their projected state aid for next year by 2,974 students. As you see, that's an increase of 27 students. So the question is, where is these students coming from? The next chart, and again, I, must, I want to thank Mr. Um, Savoya because he helped put these numbers together, is the total amount of students that we currently have who has been verified. As you see, it's only 427 students that we have that we can validate that they do actually live in um, Asbury Park. However, the projection is almost 700 is at 742, a difference of 117 students. The reason why this is an issue is based on your census, your most recent census, and you've had um, for a, a, a township, there has been um, almost 80% uh, of participation in the census. So the numbers are pretty accurate um, in regards to many other um, townships and municipalities. So based on the census, there's an increase of um, 50, um, 90 students, but based on the amount of students that actually are in Asbury Park, there's only 52 that would be um, eligible for this ages five through nine. <clears throat> If you go to the ages 10 through 14, the same thing. Based on the census, there should only there's a difference of maybe um, four students that they could add to the population for that grade. So the, but the increase that they're projecting is 115 students. So once again, where are those students coming from? Dr. Simmons, really quick. So that 115 students, what is that in dollar amounts? Uh, Ballpark. Uh, That's a good question. You. That's a good question. I didn't, I didn't calculate that one. But that's a lot. I like that one. It's a lot. And I would think that's about two million, if not more. If not more. I'm trying to do a quick calculation. 115 times, I'm use, use, um, use 30, use 30,000. Because our average is 30,000 per student. So that's 3.45. Somebody said 3.45. That's a lot of money for, for students that may just not be from Asbury Park. 3.45 million. Million. I'm making sure we say that. Million. Yeah. Million. Again, a serious problem, right? It's something that we, we, we really need to, uh, and we are. We're, on, we're doing everything we can to remedy this issue. But it is a, it's a current issue because that report showed what the state is telling us to now budget. That 14 million is a number that they're saying you should be budgeting for your charter school students. Why is that a huge impact? So now this is the revenue analysis. Again, this is not an easy, and I heard the um, resident that came up before, and she's right. The tax levy increase because of S2 is, is requiring an increase of 24% in the tax levy. That's a, that's a number that I haven't even seen in the past. Again, the S2 bill has done damage, great damage to not just district, this district, but many other districts. If there's any um, 
light at the end of the tunnel. This is the last increase that should come up, a decrease that should come about because of the S2 bill. This is the last year that this will impact you in this manner. As you see, there is a correlating decrease. <clears throat> As you go down, I have the interest earnings and the different um, reserves, but the number that I want to focus on is state aid. If you notice, there's a reduction in the equalization component of your state aid of 4.1 million. It's almost a, there's almost a very relative decrease from state aid to tax levy. Again, this is happening because of the adequacy budget and the calculation that the state created to say what is adequate for your municipality to be paying in tax revenue. That's where that number comes from. So that's why you see the reduction, and that's why you see the increase. Um, and that number comes from the budget um, system that we receive that this is the amount that should be budgeted for tax levy. Ms. Lazinski. The woman from the public who already knew we had a 24% increase in the tax levy for the schools, I didn't even know that. So I'm concerned about how Every, other people know, and we haven't even had our budget presentation yet. I, I agree, but the state aid, if I'm not, believe, I'm not, I'm not um, mistaken, it's public information at this point. So she could have opened it, got it from another district. Um, it's not, it's not, it's not private. It's not, it's not. Um, it is operable. So she could have gotten it from the state. You could probably call the state. It's kind of hard to figure out what the tax increase would be. You have to really know all. You, you would stuff. be really good at numbers. That's for sure. So maybe, yeah, so maybe the city council had the information and was able to calculate it. That's, that's all I could imagine. I know um, we, we, we was just working on that last um, week. So this is um, as recent as last Thursday. The, the other numbers, again, not significant at all in regards to the amount of the decrease, but if you notice, everything is decreasing. The budgeted fund balance, that's the number that the district saves from one year and then uses that savings to now budget into the next year. You see that even that has decreased because the amount of money we were able to save last year was 14 million. I mean, well, um, the prior year was 14 million, but this year we only came with 8.6 million. That's what the auditors gave us last time that we were here, and they um, reported on the recapitulation of balances. So that's where that number comes from. And you see that's a decrease of 5 million. I think what's really important to see is that overall, the district's revenue base um, is, is, is um, progressively decreasing. So those conversations that we continue to have are how to produce more revenue so that the burden is not, you know, on the district, not on the taxpayers is so crucial to us really maintaining and managing our budget going forward. The preschool monies, um, we're going to um, be um, sending a letter to the commissioner. We have to ask the commissioner permission and um, to utilize the free balance of uh, fund balances in preschool. They do have a fund balance and we're, I'm looking to ask for 2.5 million for that. Looking to also, we have an enterprise fund through the enterprise fund. They also have um, um, a fund balance, and I'm looking to take 250,000 from that amount. I'm also looking to support our maintenance um, in the, uh, maintenance needs with another 250,000 from maintenance reserve. That balance is just about 300,000 if I take that money. So again. Revenue sources are depleting. And last but not least, I'm going to take some money out of emergency reserve for security purposes. That's pretty much a wash because that $272,000 based on the reserve um, requirements will go towards equipment purchases for security. Overall, we have a revenue projection for 24-25 of 55,705,847. It's an overall reduction of your total budget of 5.5%, and it's a number of 3.2 million. Excuse me, I have a comment. The additional state aid, 
Do we have a number for that? We, no, there is none. <laughs> There's no additional state aid. I've called, I've asked, if, is there possibility of stabilization aid? Is there possibility of maintenance of effort aid? And I was told no. I was told that the governor in his, if you heard the address, he said he put all of the extra monies that he, um, that he had in the budget towards the increase of other districts' budgets and trying to make whole their adequacy monies that they should be receiving from the state. So as, as last year there was stabilization monies put aside for districts that were suffering through the S2, I was told that there is only $5 million statewide in that bucket. So the likelihood of us getting that for some relief is probably slim, slim to none. Dr. Simmons, in, in the past when, uh, when we'd have budget presentations, we would get an idea of what the impact the tax increases would be on an average household or an average sure. you know, property in, in, in Asbury Park. Do you have that information? I didn't do that not, um, because this is the first time we're presenting the percentage, um, but I will definitely have that done sooner than later, okay. give it to you as a board, and if you want us to put that on a, a presentation so that everybody understands it, it'll definitely be part of the presentation on in April, that impact, but I will definitely get that to you within the week. But again, being that this was the first time we really even, to uh, Ms. Lazinski's point, even mentioned what the percentage was, was, I didn't want to make any assumptions that that's what you would even do as a board. Again, because that's a big decision that you have to make in terms of what you would want. So again, that's why I said this is a preliminary. There's still a lot of discussion that needs to be had. So um, as we digest this, see what we need to do, then I'll be more than happy to give you some scenarios, okay? Um, state aid, again, I want to show you in detail the reductions. Um, they did not reduce the preschool aid. We're still um, left whole at that number, but the overall um, impact has been 4.1 million of a reduction. The charter school, I mentioned that. One of the questions was, and one of the conversations we had in the committee meeting was what to budget for charter schools, being that we only, that we only have 88 of the students verified, being that we're, they're projecting an even higher amount next year, being that we know that the census numbers don't really don't add up to that large of an increase for the charter school. So what I did was I used the first number that you see with those account numbers shows uh, original amount of 12 million six. Then it goes to the current appropriation of 11 million 959 89. Um, we currently have um, payments and um, there's the purchase order still open, but it does leave us with an available balance right now of a million six, meaning that even though it was originally projected at 12 million, we're really not going to pay out, we're only going to pay out close to $10 million. Again, a reflection that the numbers that are being estimated for next year may be overstated. Okay, and again, that agrees to, and you see the numbers of the most recent, um, this came out in December of their reduction of amount of students. As you see, that's 614. Those numbers continue to go down because of the actual students in the charter schools. So what I did was I took the current amount that you saw on the last page, 11,959,089, because I saw that we are going to not even pay out. There's a remaining balance of 1.6 million. I reduced that number by 1.5 million. So the number that I'm recommended that we appropriate for the charter schools is 10,459,089, and not the 14 million that the state is saying we should. Ms. Glassman. I don't, I don't understand why we pick that number given the magnitude of the problem as we understand it. Very good question. I picked that number <clears throat> for a couple of reasons. I know we only have 88 students verifi verified. Based on the information I gave you, we, sh we see 114 student difference. 
if we're forced as a district to budget a higher number, and I don't put it in the budget, it will leave us in a bigger hole when, when we have to then budget for that number. So this is a safety measure, budgeting at a more conservative number so that if you as a board are told to do something, you at least have the monies to do it. And I think this is a safer number um, because even if they projected the 14 million and we had to budget it, as you see, that number comes down when you start verifying the students, when the students actually come in. And the likelihood of that number continuing to go down is more than possible. So to keep it safe, to make sure that next year the money is there, I think the 10459 is a more conservative number if close to some of those students are actually in Asbury Park. So that's why I use that number. Great question. <clears throat> Lastly, um, these are the total appropriations. So as you know, the, um, the general fund sends money into whole school reform and that amount that I'm projecting for next year is $20 million, meaning we budget $20 million from Fund 11. It goes over to whole school reform, which goes into the schools, and that's how they're able to manage the school budgets. Again, the charter school number is at $10 million, $459,089. Both of those are 13% decreases from the prior year. Um, just as totals, we have regular education. We still have our numbers pretty healthy for regular education in our Fund 11 numbers and increases in special education and um, also in a couple other areas. Overall, instructional did not take a big hit in this area right now. We see a slight increase of 942,948. A lot of that is due to what is required in some of the um, classrooms and different things like that. As we look at the rest of the um, what we call undistributed numbers, we see a huge increase in um, out, of, um, out of district tuition uh, numbers in this area um, based on just the new tuition rates and just the average out of district placement for special ed is about 125,000. Um, that continues. Um, so we have using next year's projected rates. So you see that huge increase of a million seventy four for our charter school. I'm um, not charter schools for our out of district tuition. The other areas you see those decreases to really supplement some of the increases that we had to go with, like tuition and um, other areas, transportation and things like that. So as you see, the overall undistributed budget has gone down by six, um, but has gone up by six percent. But as you see, there's some large number of increases that we had to go with. As I mentioned, transportation, employee benefits, the average for that um, increase is about 10% that um, our brokers are telling us to budget. So um, this is why we have a slight increase, but again, you see the major decreases as you look down the other lines. Again, not easy decisions at all. We have an increase for some equipment. Um, Mr. Cancel, thank you for everything he does. But um, in maintaining some of our equipment, we still need to do replacement of about 100,000. So we're gonna continue to budget for that. Our overall instructional numbers for um, whole school reform, this is the actual numbers in the school buildings, is a decrease of $12 million. Again, being able to maximize the monies and based on the reduction, um, that's the overall decrease of about 19%. Non-instructional, another 18% decrease. So we're going from a whole school reform classroom in all three, four schools of 25 million from this year to 20 million next year. That contribution, like I mentioned, from the Fund 11 is going to be the 20 million. Again, that $3 million decrease. And the next piece of that is that is Title I also contributes to each school. Last year was budgeted at 1.2 million. We actually did not get, um, actually it was 1.4 million. We only got 1.2, so we was actually down by 300,000. What I didn't want to do was do the same thing going into next year, so we're conservatively put in about 939,000 from the Title I um, contribution. And again, that's in the impact of the free and reduced applications is why we're seeing that number decrease. So overall, we're going with a, a whole school reform, meaning the money in each building of a total of 20,939,189. Um, the 
the next steps. Again, tonight's board approval is just to submit the budget. You still, as a board, um, are not making a decision on any number. You still have the ability um, to do that at the April 25th um, public hearing on the budget. I encourage um, public, um, taxpayers, everybody to come out to, to hear, um, to, to again go through the budget, the tentative on um, the budget and review, and again continue to ask questions. We are diligently looking to get resolution to the charter school estimated enrollment issues that we're facing in both the 23-24 year and the 24-25 year, as we mentioned prior. And again, I think we have to put a lot of effort. I talked to Mr. Jabino and, um, and, and and Ms. Brown, and we're looking to put some incentives in the school to really get um, parents to fill out these applications and get it back to us. It's so important that we move those numbers up so that some of the, the Title I monies and any other federal monies that we do receive has the best number and the more accurate number for Asbury Park. So those are some of the things we need to do going forward. And. Um, any other questions that you have, I'll be more than happy to answer that, but that's the presentation for the budget right now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. As I've said earlier, I wouldn't want to be in um, Mr. Bino's seat right now because this budget is going to be, hit us hard. I know it's not going to, some things are not going to be popular, but the board will support him as I understand as of right now. The thing that we need to focus on first, I, and this is my thought process, as um, Mr. S uh, Dr. S I'm sorry, Dr. Simmons alluded to, is verification of the charter school's student enrollment. That's our first thing. And my thought process is for the second thing is the preschool enrollment as well. And then we can move forward and get some of those monies back. Mr. President, I actually had a, had a question about um, how, do we, how we're going to go about verifying that because it just came to us that, you know, recently that the onus legally is on us to verify the residency and um, and also to see how we can, if we, if we need to vote on anything tonight uh, or regarding that in terms of um, taking action towards towards you know whoever we have to or whatever we have to hire to to make those verifications happen I think it starts with our legal counsel first to see what we can do and cannot do right and um, Mr. Weiss and his um, law group will advise us and say what we can do because I Right. I'm not a legal scholar by no stretch of the imagination. So the board um, currently has counsel uh, for this issue, and um, there is a process by which the board can seek to verify can seek to verify um, residency, and um, I know that your counsel, who's representing you on this issue, um, does have some ideas and some resources that are available in order to um, get that verification process underway. So I would expect that through counsel, you, you're probably going to be retaining um, some professionals to, to conduct that verification process, which hopefully will yield um, or help to uncover some students who perhaps don't uh, should have their tuition paid for by districts other than Asbury Park. And the other piece to it is, I think that we as voters should support senators and um, government officials to make it on the onus on the charter schools to provide that information. It, but that's that's a long-term fix. But we need a fix right now. One other thing I just wanted to, to point out to the public, um, because here's the thing: what what Mr. Soner said is completely accurate. If we don't let our voice be heard, not only here, but also in Trenton. Okay. 
Um, we have to make sure that, that our voices are heard, not only here, but when there are hearings about this matter. So um, just really quick, the Assembly Budget Committee is, is having a hearing March 20th um, at the State House in Trenton at 9.30, and it's a chance for, the, for public input specifically on the budget. The Senate Budget Appropriations Committee has a hearing on the 19th um, at NJIT in Newark, also to gather feedback from citizens regarding the budget. And then there's even a virtual hearing taking place on March 26th um, where citizens can participate remotely and contribute their perspective, perspectives on budget related matters and that's at 10 a.m. Um, and you can Google or if you need to you know let's see if we can get some of that information out to the public because if we don't if they don't hear from Asbury Park families Asbury Park homeowners Asbury Park students board members staff um, they're not going to know that there's a problem there's 500 and change uh, municipalities and over 600 school districts in this state. Um, we need to make sure that folks know that if this continues or if this stays as is, we're in big trouble as a school district. Um, whether it's a 24% tax increase on homeowners, I know I won't be able to sustain that as a homeowner and we'd get pushed out of, out of Asbury Park. Um, or if that's all cuts, we're not going to have a school district anymore. Um, so that's just what I had to say about Mr. it. Mr. Carrillo, and where did it. you get those hearing dates? Are they available on our website? Um, I just, you know what, I, I, I just Googled it really quick and uh, it, it showed up on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, the state government website. So if you go to njledge.state.nj.us, uh, you'll see all the different committee hearings. Uh, can you send it to all of us? Sure. And then we can um, disperse it. Thank you. Yep. Uh, the other piece to it is, and this is just, I'm just thinking out loud right now, is the fact that we have to work with the city as well. Because they gave all these abatements to these different. Can't hear it now, John. Right. And this is just me talking out loud. Um, they gave all these abatements to these different property owners and didn't give us enough money as far as the, the school board to be sustainable. That's the other piece to it as well. Well, I would, I, I would say this. The, the, the city, um, you know, is... is is going to be meeting with us hopefully soon um, and where we could kind of clarify a lot of that stuff um, but the city's not a deadbeat they've been paying what they what they you know what they, they were they've been asked um, but we should see if there are creative ways so that way um, there are creative ways to increase revenue without having impact on uh, homeowners and taxpayers um, so it's something that we're, we're discussing and we're going to look at all the different options that we, we've got there, but point taken. We need to start working, uh, and I believe we're going to start working a lot closer with the city. I know that uh, you were, uh, Mr. President, we're talking about the Finance Committee meeting with the city um, to continue discussions that started last year, so I, I appreciate that. Uh, first, I want to say, when we, when we start looking at these numbers, and there's a lot of errors, I mean not errors, but issues that, are, that we don't even understand and talk about. We have the S2 bill that didn't calculate numbers for a pilot program, that didn't give students uh, money in our, in our district. We're looking at verifying uh, charter schools that now have taken our enrollment and decreased it by, uh, numbers that should have never happened. Uh, we're looking at the fact that we, I believe, have a district that has a chance of rebuilding itself, 
but the onus is not on this board, just on this board, just on administration, but on the teachers, on the parents, on the citizens, that we have to get out and let the, everybody know that we're going to start working together and to advocate for ourselves. There's, there's a bill right now. Uh, in the Senate that they're working on, which will give us money back for special education, which is a big problem in our district, that has to take away census-based that uh, uh, pro uh, process that allows us to uh, be underfunded in the fact of dealing with these kids. We also have to look at the S2. We have to look at what what other what other districts are getting. We have to look at the fact that you know we have not gotten our opportunity to rectify what we need to do to get things done and I think right now we have this opportunity and that means everybody and I'm hoping since we're on the internet and this is going to go out to everybody is that when these bit, uh, uh, budget hearings are coming up these these uh, calls that you make to your senators to your assembly people that you get out there and advocate for us Asbury Park the district that is providing services for our kids. And right now, we have to look at how we're going to better serve this community. If we don't, this is the opportunity to lose it. But we have an opportunity to gain it and gain national respect because I think we can do it. I think we have the opportunity to think outside the box. We're going to look at other opportunities. We're going to meet with the city. We're going to meet with the commissioner, uh, president, I would like to request that those, those meetings be we set up and that we are also uh, meeting with uh, the governor if we have to because he's making these decisions and says he's fully funding schools, which if you just seen by what we have, we're not. And some of these legislative ideals that uh, the S2 bill brought in did not correct. Or the fact that there's not a legal obligation for a charter school to verify or be made to verify who they're accounting for. All these things are legislative things that we have to advocate for. We have to advocate for what we're going to expect and new programming. What we need for our special needs kids because we need more. Right now, I, I've always said, and I, and I said this, you, it should not be the zip code that you live in that determines the education of any child. And right now, it seems to be happening with Asbury Park. So right now, I'm taking a step, and I'm going to be in Trenton more, doing whatever I can to make sure everybody knows that our district needs help, that we need, we need support. We need to advocate for our kids who need the opportunity to be the next president or vice president of this country. We have the opportunity to make this move, and this is what we need to do. It's not all this bickering and, and, and one side or the other. I, I've never been about that. I'll sit down and talk to anybody and get anything done. That's what I feel about what I do every day in my life when I get up. And I try to make sure that people have housing, a place to live, and what they need. We now have to provide for this education because that's the next stage for these kids to go out to take care of us as we become adults. So I'm, I'm saying to us as this board, I'm going to say to the governor, I'm going to say to our senator, I'm going to say to our assembly person, I'm going to say everybody else to the council. We need the support, we expect, and we're going to live up to the opportunities that they see that this, this, this district is about. And I, and I want to support not only from this board, from the teachers, from the parents, and for the property tax owners. Yeah. Um, let's do committee reports next. Let's start with Mr. Remy. Um, buildings and grounds. Uh, we met. We talked about the tennis courts with the um, about the tennis initiative uh, with the board's approval. We plan on moving it forward. Um, they want to do. They want to give us funds so they can build tennis courts without us, without the district having to come out of pocket. And that's um, between the middle school and um, between Barack and Dr. Martin Luther King and also at the high school as well. Um, 
Um, we talked about emergency reserve. We already went through the budget, so I don't need to go through all that. Um, and we also talked about the asbestos issue in Obama and seeing ways how we can um, just get just future use with Obama, um, how we can move forward, how we can get uh, community or involvement um, programs, certain things that we can do in that building. That's basically it. Thank you, sir. Okay. The Finance Committee has met with our new acting superintendent six times, probably close to 15 hours in the past three weeks in an effort to evaluate the funding for the Asbury Park School District for 24-25 and the impact of the state budget and cuts in aids to Asbury Park on our ability to provide a fair, equitable, and com comprehensive education for our children. The governor's message of full school budget funding does not apply to our district. As a district feeling probably the greatest effects of cuts from S2, equating on its face as an additional cut of 4.1 million, but to which we add the loss of additional aid we were able to receive last year of 5 million, the true impact is over $9 million over the last year. We're facing a crisis. The initial draft analysis submitted by the interim business administrator showed an increase in charter school appropriations to about 14 million, and that's what you saw tonight. We still lack residency verification for College Achieve on hundreds of students. If that amount must be paid, it contributes to our passing on a tax levy of 24%, and expenses will still be need to dra be drastically cut by more than $4 million above planned expense reductions. The steps will be drastic if additional aid is not forthcoming, including potentially shutting out some of our lights. None of these are the outcomes that our new acting superintendent and the finance committee desire. That is why we have worked together diligently and collaboratively, both one, to reduce expenses within our control, including litigation expenses and further investigation of shared service programs with other districts in the city, and two, to support adding programs that will increase revenue into the district, not out, and ultimately increase educational opportunities enrollment and the state aid. We want to support a budget centered on student education that's fiscally sound. Mr. Garino has presented concrete proposals that we agree will quickly increase revenue and increase enrollment through offering programs attractive to other districts and bringing back our own students to Asbury Park, such as alternative schools, trade programs, and health programs. I will leave it to Mr. Gimino to discuss those in his report. We've also met with Senator Gopal to state our needs and the draconian effects of the cut in aid and potential cuts that we will be required to make. We've asked for additional aid. We've asked for a loan. We have asked to be relieved of the unfair burden of the charter school payments without proof that students we pay for live in the city. We will continue those conversations with Senator Gopal and other county and state officials and legislators. As we've already discussed, uh, the board and the acting superintendent will be asking to meet with the state education commissioner and the governor. We ask that you, our residents, join our voices with our voices. And we believe that this district is in a position to turn a new page and provide an education that we can be proud of, but we need fiscal aid, even short-term aid, to get to this new vision moving forward immediately in the next school year. Thanks, Ms. Glassman. Thanks to all the committee chairs. Did um, I miss anyone? Mr. President, may um, I? Could um, we receive uh, minutes of the committee since I'm omitted from most of them? I'd I didn't know what happened, and I'd like to know what happened in committees before a public meeting if I could get minutes next month. Not a problem. I'll speak with all the committee chairs and then we can move forward. Okay, let's move forward to the um, the.
state monitors report. Again, just to conserve time, my um, focus is purely on the development of an approvable budget that provides for the students of Asbury. <clears throat> That's been the sole focus of the state monitor over the last couple of weeks, and pretty much will be going forward until the approval process is done. Superintendent's report. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to go through some things that I've been doing over the last two weeks and then uh, things that I want to look to look to do in the future. So we know that I, I have been visiting at least one to two buildings daily and visiting every time I'm visiting a school, I visit every classroom just to show my face and, and make sure that everybody sees me present. I have weekly principal and supervisors meeting, being present, being available, building issues and concerns are what is discussed. I have settled all affirmative action complaints when I met with board attorney and board leadership and finance teacher and the teachers union representation. I have a standing meeting with the county superintendent every Thursday morning where we share ideas and discuss what I have been doing and what I've been working on. We had Read Across America last week. Uh, it was fantastic. And uh, I want to thank everyone that came out to read, not only in district, but our guests that have come out and shared their talents with our students. Again, I'm in constant communication with the billing principals to create more, a more cohesive environment. I have asked them to reach out to each other to form a cohort of professionals so that they can share ideas and concerns. It's important that leadership is shared and that they feel comfortable working as a team. Since I started, I've been working on the budget with our BA and our state monitor. This is an uphill battle, as we all heard tonight, and there will be tough decisions to make in the future. I have met with the Asbury Park Tennis Initiative Group to discuss refurbishing the tennis courts, with, which uh, Mr. Remy has said, and uh, you know they, they were looking to refurbish the courts between Barack Obama and MLK, and I said I will not approve that unless you give me the high school as well, and they said we've already raised half the funds to complete the work at the high school tennis course as well. So we should be getting courts in both areas. Um, talking to the athletic coordinator, there is interest from kids that want to play tennis. I've been in communication with the council, with Councilwoman Miss Angela Abez Anderson to discuss several initiatives such as creating a building and trades curriculum and program. This program will not only create a certification program for our students, but also offer the program to our surrounding districts to send their students to us, therefore generating revenue and increasing enrollment. Mr. Ruiz and I have been discussing bringing back our nursing program, which we lost, and adding a phlebotomy certification program. This is another program that Ms. Abez Anderson and I have been discussing long term. I completed a walk through Barack Obama Elementary, as Mr. Remy said prior, uh, with the head of maintenance. We discussed the viability of using the building for future student programs and community programs. We'll be working with the necessary agencies that will help make our, inf make our form informed decision. I have sent an email to staff and board members are putting together a focus group to look in into bringing an alternative program back to the district. This way we can service our own students instead of sending students out. And also we'll generate revenue because we will be a receiving district instead of a sending district, which has always been what we have doing for the last several years. I've identified cost deduction options and will be working closely with our business office, the state monitor, and finance committee to ensure we optimize the funds that we have, but to also look to create revenue generating programs. This will help the district in creating more programs rather than having to cut programs for our students. And lastly, it is time for us to heal and change the climate and culture of our district. We owe it to our students, we owe it to our community, we owe it to our staff. For years, the district has been kicking the can down the road and expecting a different outcome. Our district faces a major economic shortfall that has never been fully addressed throughout the years. But now, it's time we face it. 
again, it's because the can has been kicked down the road. There are going to be many tough decisions that I, as a superintendent, have to make. I have inherited the shortcomings of the past and now need to fix them. I continually meet with our state senator and business administrator to look for ways to create a budget that will allow us to keep growing. I will do everything in my power to affect our students because our, our students are the most important priority. I will continue to meet with those who can help us explain why it's important that we, that sorry, they lend us a hand. The road will not be easy, but I will work tirelessly to put our district on a path to success. I have called Asbury Park my home since 2001. This place will always hold a large part of my heart. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. I know I, I went just, out of I order. Had, I had a question for, um, where are the tennis court site that they picked in the high school? Because I, I don't know if they picked the one where the basketball court is or? The original site, the original one. That's a lot of money. It's not coming out of our pocket. That was estimated to be $2 million. Just, I just want, just to tell everybody that. They've assured us that they're gonna pay for everything soup to nuts. And they were informed of the cost as well. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, mean, I know I went a little bit out of order, but I need the HIV report. Who's doing that? No report? Okay. Let's move forward. It's it's on the agenda. The report Okay, is. yeah. Um, let's do the acceptance of minutes. Motion. Move it. Second. Questions, comments? You're speaking of number 13. A and B on page A2, is that what you're referring to? Yes. And I um, did distribute the closed session min minutes also. Thank you. Everybody should have caught that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll call the roll right now. Ms. Um, it was motioned by Mr. S um, President Saunders. And I believe Mr. Grillo was seconded. Thank you. Ms. Glassman? Yes, approved. Ms. Lazinski? Yes. Dr. Maxud? Yes. Yes. Mr. Remy? He will be right back. <laughs> left his Apple Thank you. watch. <laughs> Mr. Rogers? Uh, yes, on, on A, abstain on B. Mr. Grillo? <clears throat> yes, on both. Mr. Um, President Sanders, sir? Yes. Motion passed. I'm sorry, Ms. Ricks. Ms. Ricks. I heard you. Good to hear you, Ms. Ricks. <laughs> Thank you. I would like a motion to um, the superintendent's agenda from B1 to B6. Um, um, prior to that, we have um, revised district calendar 14 and um, it's, a, it's attachment A14 and A15 on the same page as the minutes. Uh, I'll move those two, I'll make a motion. Thank those you. Two. Second. Okay, this motion is for um, the revised district calendar. There's two attachments. Mm -hmm. um, it's 14 and 15, attachment A14 and A15. Ms. Glassman? Yes, on the revised calendar. Thank you. Ms. Zinski? Yes. Thank you. Dr. Maxud? Yes. 
Thank you. Ms. Ricks? Thank you. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Thank you. Vice President Grillo? Yes. President Saunders? Yes. Motion passed. Thank you. We'll move to the superintendent a, at this point. Mr. President, I have a question about the superintendent's agenda. Um, we had a discussion about 10A. Um, I don't know if, so you want it, that would be adjusted, that's not? Yeah, we, we have to, uh, the, the, the top line in that uh, job description has to be amended. Uh, the person that is doing the job would not be a supervisor. So the whole job description has ha, was done right, except for that one line at top. So we have to make an adjustment there. Just cross, we just got to cross it out. I actually, and, and to be clear, just, just so that everybody knows what we're talking about on that item, uh, the adjustment would be that that individual will not be a supervisor. So that just so the public and, and the board members are aware of what the adjustment will be. So when you vote, um, you'll be voting on the adjusted description, which will remove reference to it being a supervisory position. Thank you. So, so we're looking at items B1 and B6. B6 I, yes. I actually have one other uh, question. I noticed. Um, B3 item 13 and B5 item 24 um, seem to be have the same language, except 24 has the actual resolution. Is that correct? Or seem so uh, it's B313, which is the sustainable jersey for schools, mm -hmm. right? And then if you look at B524, it's the same. Okay. All right. Just making sure, that's all. Right. Not as a for I just got to So we can we can eliminate thirteen because twenty four has all the information. It's actually more uh, thorough. So when we make the motion, um, whoever makes the motion, if you could um, break it out so that it would be items B1 number one through B312, and then B414 um, through the remainder B626. <laughs> consent agenda admitting the one number. You could item. do that as well. <laughs> uh, may make more sense actually. It's B313 is the one you want to omit. I have a question. Um, uh, B1419 and 20, one of the uh, parents' concern was why this summer classes are not extended to Friday and why it has changed to Monday to Thursday. Are we able to, okay. Yeah, we, we're ex actually extending the, the days. It'll be a four day work a week. The, the four days will be ex extended an hour. We are closing the schools on Friday uh, to conserve money, to have the buildings closed on Fridays. Is there any alternative um, child care for parents that are working on Fridays? Well, we still have the Boys and Girls Club that will be running on Fridays as well. Uh, we just have to figure a location where they would 
pick the students up at? We're having a meeting tomorrow. By next board meeting, you'll kind of have a little bit more of information about how the summer will look in its totality. But we've always run a four-day summer program with the exception of ESY, which did in the past run four days and then also ran five days. Yes. But given the consideration about trying to close the buildings, we're looking to at least have, if we can do one building, that's where we'll have everything and, and we'll, well, we'll have more information for next month because I'm actually meeting tomorrow okay. with boys and girls. So that'll give us a little more information. So could we table this? If, if, if I may respond, Dr. Maksu? Yes. So this is specific to our extended school year program for our students with disabilities who qualify for the extended school year program per their IEP. In order for the district to receive extraordinary aid for those students, which is a stream of revenue to bring back into the district, it must be a 30-day program. Okay. In order to be consistent with the rest of the summer programs in district, the recommendation was made that we move to it being Monday to Thursday for this summer for that reason. But it does need to remain that 30 days so we can apply for extraordinary aid. And in my time in the district, the extraordinary aid revenue that we've received has increased from roughly 500000 to $1.2 million. So it's worth it. Okay. Thank you. I'm looking for a consent agenda from B1 to B6. Excluding. Excluding on 13, right? Yeah. Uh, move that. Second. Second. Questions, discussions? <laughs> Keep that. Again, this is consent eliminating item 13 and the amendment of 10A for no supervision. Ms. Glassman? Yes. Ms. Lazinski? Yes. Dr. Maxud? Approved. Mr. Remy? Yes, I come back. Ms. Ricks? John, can you put the microphone by her, by the speaker? No. Say it again, Miss Ricks. B two, number nine, page B two, ten. A on page B3, and as I understand it, you removed item 13 on B3? Yes. Yes. Yes, that's correct. All others, uh, I vote yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ricks. <coughs> Mr. Rogers? Yes. Vice President Grillo? Uh, yes, I'm abstaining on uh, B3 number 11, B3 number 12, and um, B5 number 24. We're moving B3 number 13. Right? Thank you. President Saunders? Yes. Thank you. I'm looking for a consent agenda for C1 through C6. I'll move it. Second. Roll call. Any questions, comments first? And no, you have to you raise a question before the vote. Oh, you're going to object. Okay. 
Okay, no questions, comments? Roll call, please. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, moving fast. I know we want to get out of here. I just want to make sure. The, the tentative budget is C1 number four for everyone's information, right? Okay. I have a question. Um, C5, item 15. Would I be able to get more information about the program or itemized uh, list of the early childhood programmatic budget? Yes, I actually have. Um, if it's, it's, it's attached, it's, you should see the C15. C15, it's attached. And if for whatever reason you don't see it there, I do have copies here with me. It's not, it's not. Uh, yeah, what is it is it's the last last page. Okay. What's what's the uh what's the uh the charter school? That's the charter school? No, this is the early childhood um budget. Okay. But the charter school you would just payment? Say, no it, just say no until the this is not charter school. This is the um, students that go to the Asbury Park schools and the two providers that we have in district. The question uh, Mr. Rogers has is the charter school is under uh, bills and claims. So if somebody has a, a specific, specific line vote, oh. no, it's not a specific line. No, just mention the right. charter school and what your vote is under bills and claims. Oh, they got the charter school. Uh, let, let, then I'll raise what I was going to raise later, but unless you can show me where it is under bills and claims, the only place I see um, the college achieve is under the check register. Yeah, that's where it is. Okay, but that's not bills and claims, it's under check register. Oh, it's a bill. Those words are interchangeable. Bills uh, and claims, if checks. You, if you say so, it's a separate, okay, <laughs> separate category. Fine, okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Roll call, please. <clears throat> Ms. Glassman? Okay, I'm gonna do this slowly. <laughs> uh, no on C1. No on C4, tentative budget. Um, Ms. Glassman, no. when, you, when you said no on C1, did that mean the whole page or just number four? On C1? Um, I think so. So uh, char just charter achieve. Uh, college achieve, sorry. C1A and C4. Which is, I, I don't have it. Uh, C1A. So it's a C1. And, and, and C you want me to keep going or not? And C14, right? What? C14. C14, correct. No okay. on the budget, okay. yes. Um, I'm, I'm not done yet. Um, <laughs> um, I have a few more no's. Uh, no on uh, C10A. Um, no on C14. C2. C3. No. Miss Glassman, you said C10A, but I, did you mean C4 number 10A? Sorry, C4 10A. Yep, she got Correct. Sorry. Um, C5 14. And that's it. Thank you. Are the others a yes? The others yes. are yes. Okay, thank you. Ms. Lezinski? Everything yes except for the payment to College Achieve. Thank you. 
Dr. Maksud. Rejecting C1A, C14, C410A, and C1, yeah, I, I did say C14, right? Mm -hmm. And, and Dr. Maksud, C11A as well. Yes, thank you. thank you for clarifying that. And then you said C10A, and is there any of those? C410A. And that's a yes on the others? Yes on everything else. Mr. Remy? No on C11A and C14 and C410A and yes on everything else. Can I revise something? I got my pages mixed up. Um, could you please take out C14? Uh, Dr. Maksud, when you say take out, do you mean um, uh, you're a no for that? or I am voting yes to C14. So you're voting yes on the tentative budget, to be yes. clear. Thank you. Ms. Ricks? No, I'm sorry, Mr. Remy? No on Oh, you told me yes. yes. I'm sorry. Mm. <laughs> getting a little confused, sorry. I know, <laughs> I know it's late. Ms. Ricks, I'm, Ms. Ricks? No on College Achieve, yes on everything else. Thank you. No on <clears throat> Mr. Rogers? No on no on college achieve. Uh, C one four no. Uh, C three nine B no. Also, when when if we well this is a question. Uh, if we were disapproving bills and claims and we said no, were we saying everything yep. or just college achieve? No. So, I'm just yeah, yeah. You, you would say everything unless you specifically said just one check. Yeah. So you could choose a check or you could choose the whole bill list. Yeah, some, yeah. So if you say 1A, then it's the whole bill bills list. Okay, yeah. So just college achieve. Thank you. Mr. Grillo? Um, I'm voting yes, except I'm voting uh, on I'm voting yes on everything, except I'm voting no on the College Achieve um, on C11A. I'm voting no on C1 number four. I'm voting no on C2 number seven. I'm voting no on C4 number 10A, and voting no on C5 number 14. And President Saunders. Okay, no on C1A and C14. Everything else, yes. Yeah, the budget fail. Which one is that? Dr. Simmons. Right, which one? Yes. I'm sorry, wait. Hold on one second, because... I thought I got that one. Let me see. You want, you want a paper copy, Jim? Yeah. Can I get a paper copy? Because I'm scrolling like crazy. There you go. Sorry about that. Oh, thank you for all the papers. Um, I'm dealing with the same. <laughs> sorry. I have the electronic copy and the paper copy. So, um, voting no to C14. My apologies. Okay, Dr. Simmons, just to make sure you have my nose. Okay. 
I have you no know, on college achieve, co um, no on the budget, mm -hmm. no on C7, C10A, and C14. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, just making sure. Uh, Mr. President, since we, voted, since we voted no on the budget, we may look to uh, do a special after we've started some of these meetings to discuss uh, approving uh, the tentative budget. So, I mean, uh, will we look at that? We can look at that. I can reach out to all the board members and just see what their availability is, and then we can go from there. If everyone could email me their availability, or call me, rather, because I, I'm, I'm, as far as, like, uh, the budget. Can I just um, make a point? The requirement is for us to submit the budget on March tw um, 20th. If we don't submit, the budget will be out of compliance. And I can't really tell you what happens after that. Um, so there is a need to submit something. And so we would need to have a meeting prior to the 20th, because it's due on the 20th. And I'm not sure what changes you're looking to make. So I would rec um, recommend Monday, Tuesday. What's the thought? I, I don't know what to say. You know, it's Wednesday's the 20th, so. What's the thought process of the board? Uh, if it has to be Tuesday, I'm, I'll make myself available. Uh, we need to have more discussions on this budget. Uh, I don't, I don't think it's going to be anything drastic, but we still have to have more discussions on this budget. I have a question, Dr. Simmons. If we don't submit anything by the 20th, does the state take over and recommend or make us or do their own cuts in a way? That's what happens, right? You know what, I'm going to throw that one to the state monitor. <laughs> Good answer. Your submission by statute is to the county office, so I wouldn't want to speak on behalf of Dr. Richens. The only thing I could tell you is Dr. Richens was here. He's actually texting me. He's really interested in the results of your vote. So anything that I do in my capacity, anything is going to be done completely in conjunction with, with Dr. Richens. Um, so I can't speak for him now, but as soon as we come about with a course of action, um, other than what is already statutory, you know, the, um, in the, in the the calendar and the deadlines, yeah. So we'll we'll work with the district, but I'm I'm letting you know, Dr. Richards, know right now that you still have work continuing on the budget development. Uh, Thank you. If we can ask the state monitor, I mean, if we don't make this meeting, and he talks to Dr. Richards, and we go with this preliminary budget that we disapproved, I I can go along with that. But letting everyone else know that we are still going to be fo focusing on this budget increasingly uh, to make changes because this this is a draconian budget which no one I don't know anybody that wants to see this budget passed uh, at all the way it's going to be uh, let me add to that if, if I may because uh, especially in terms of why we were elected to the board and folks in Asbury Park families in Asbury Park um, voted for us to stand up to these kinds of draconian cuts and to work with the state, work with our elected officials to do what we can to stave off something that's going to be devastating to our district. So, I mean, to be frank, there's no way in hell that I could vote for a 24% tax increase and um, I'm that's sure that my me. fellow colleagues feel the same way. And I'm going to add to that, um, we basically got this this evening, um, one hour before this meeting started. Um, there reflects very little uh, input from, from this board. Um, I think that everyone knows that this is, as it stands, unacceptable to us. This does not reflect um, 
the vision that we have for for this district and um, another vote would be a formality. It would not be meaningful. Um, I think it would be it would be don dishonest for me personally uh, to vote in favor of submitting this uh, deadline or not. So um, unless everybody's willing to roll up their sleeves over the next three days and spend six hours or eight hours a day working on this thing. I don't know what better budget you're going to present to us um, for submission, but it, this, is, this is an unacceptable budget. Just for clarity, we this is the budget that we talked about in the committee. The revenue, I understand, is not, like I said in the presentation, this was the largest cut I've ever worked with. It's not something that I was happy to even work through. And this is just myself, Mr. Gerbino, Ms. Brown. Um, Mr. Savoya, it was a number of us that's been working on this. This is this is a hard budget to deal with. Dr. I understand. Simmons, <clears throat> I just saw this for the first time tonight. That's why I was confused with my digital copy and this copy. I just saw this tonight. Never heard of it. I'm not in that committee, so I was not aware of it. Um, I was going back and forth why I have something on my list as a no and why here. It's just, it was just too confusing. Um. Understandable. I, um, I did make recommendations to have meetings prior to get the board together to do this, extra committee meetings, and there was really no response to even gather because it is hard to make your first presentation at a board meeting. Um, never got any responses to try to get additional committee meetings, additional board meetings to really discuss this. So here we are today. <clears throat> I will say this, um, your, your, your vote does not say you're in agreement with what's going on because that's not what the vote is tonight. It's just to submit it to make sure that we dotted all our I's and crossed our T's on the county level. Your vote that adopts the budget is April 25th. You're not adopting the budget tonight. You're just telling us that we could submit the paperwork to the county so that they can approve for us to advertise it so that the public can get a good look and be able to participate properly for April 25th. That's what their approval does. But Dr. Simmons, <clears throat> this is not what we want to submit to the public. I understand it, this is preliminary, but is. We, we, we feel this is unconscionable to our community. And, I and the number and what was submitted to the finance committee was two pages of charts and a series of zeros. So please, we did not receive anything that looked like a budget at that time. And as I reported out, this committee has met on several occasions. You may not have been present at all of those meetings, but this committee sat diligently trying to figure out. I wasn't present at any of those meetings. So I, I could not even speak to the 15 hours you referred to earlier. Well, that includes and, the virtual meeting that we had. And I think that that's, that's part of the point. Can Either this is a process that we do together. I'm the I'm I'm the business administrator. And it's we my asked, job to go through the, the details. It's it's Dr. my Simmons. job to go through the details based on the recommendations you make. Dr. Simmons. I have no recommendations to go off of. I've worked with Mr. Javino and the staff and pretty much try to present where we came from. Dr. Simmons, I asked you directly and I was admonished for doing that. I asked 
through the superintendent, both, the, both Dr. Adams and also Mr. Jabino, for information in advance of the finance committee meeting um, that you participated in, and we received nothing until, until the meeting. So again, I think it is disingenuous to say that we've had an opportunity to seriously consider this, and again, it is unconscionable to us to present this to the public as something that we are seriously considering passing. I understand your concerns, and I have the same concerns as far as like the the, in, the increase. So I get it. Recommendations from the board. Well, if we need to meet next week, Mr. President, then you know um, it has to be submitted by the 25th, Dr. Simmons. I'm sorry, 28th. So that's that's 20th. 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 But, but again, what is the consequence if we're late? Uh, um, I think it may be among said. other things, it would certainly count against you, um, most likely for governance as it relates to QSAC, um, among among other things. Um, you know, I don't know where Dr. Richens stands on this. I'm interested to hear after he. Um, you know, considers what, what happened this evening. Um, we may get some more clarity and some next steps and suggestions for next steps from Dr. Richens uh, tomorrow or, you know, the following days as a result of what happened tonight. But we can't be expected to come back into a room with the exact same document and be expected to approve it over our objections. Can I, can I say this? The same thing happened last year. If you remember, we voted down the budget, and the state monitor at the time, you know, overrode our vote, and that budget was submitted. Um, I don't want this budget to be to to be submitted in any form, but look, I, I think our votes stand that we are we're voting down this budget, and if the state monitor needs to override it, then that's his prerog his or her prerogative. So um, I think we just go forward. Let's see if we can have a, a couple meetings um, before the 20th, you know, uh, with the Finance Committee um, and see what Dr. Richens also suggests. I also think we need to look into uh, calling for a, a, an interest-free loan and seeing if that's something that the, the state is willing to uh, confirm for us that they would want to do amortized over 10 years um, and if we can put that either part of as part of the budget or at least that will give us give me a, a give me personally a little more comfort in terms of voting for a budget a different budget next week even so we have we, we have a lot of think? next steps uh, like I said we have a lot of meetings I think a lot of communication with other stakeholders and other partners. So, you know, it's, it's whatever Richens has to do, but I, I think continually we're gonna be working on this budget until April 25th, and I think we need to make sure we're just ready to get in there and get this work done. There's a lot of stuff that's on the table, so let's, let's move forward. If we go the long route, I feel like we definitely need to find a way to get some revenue as well. But um, I'm going to switch my vote because I don't want something to happen where the state takes over and it's like they make cuts or they do their own thing. And I don't want, I don't know, I'm, I got a bad vibe from it. So we can accept it now and then work until the 25th to do what we need to do. But if we don't have it submitted by the 20th, which is Wednesday, I don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot type of thing. That just... Uh, 
All right. Can we make a, a motion to adjourn? Well, hang on one second. Because um, I'm not clear uh, if Mr. Remy's going to change his vote. I don't know what that does to the outcome of the, the, the vote that was just taken. Uh, what was the number? It doesn't change anything? Okay. But on the record, though, Mr. Remy, your vote will be changed as a result of your request. No, nah, I'm, I'm going I'm to stick with my board members. Okay, so just we all gonna drown together if just that's what it takes. Okay. Hey, we're not drowning. I'm not drowning. I can swim. <laughs> so you're gonna. So Mr. Remy, just to be clear for the record, you're leaving your vote as you originally. I'm gonna ride with my team. All Got right. it. Thank you. Okay. I want to thank Ms. Ricks for um, joining the meeting. I know she's on vacation, and I just want to put on the record that um, Ms. Lazinski has left the meeting. Okay. I want to make a motion to adjourn this meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh.